Poland. In a small Polish farm community of 1981, events occurred which electrified the world, sending reverberations of magnitude to capitals as diverse as Washington, Peking, and especially Moscow. This village of Bukovo, 763 souls, stood at the spot where the great river Vistula turns to the north in its stately passage from its birthplace in the Carpathian Mountains at the south to its destiny in the Baltic Sea at the north. Nearly 36 million Poles, of whom 18 million were of voting age, were controlled by the Communist Party of only 3 million members. This minority had made a symbolic concession right at the start of the present trouble. They agreed to hold the discussion over farm policy in the very village from which the principal protester came, and this was interpreted by all as a sincere gesture of goodwill. But as Yanko Buk, the leader they were trying to placate, said, With the steel strikers giving them so much trouble in Gdansk, they can't afford to have us on their backs, too. The communists had chosen this village for several reasons. It lay in the heart of a large agricultural district and was thus representative. It was also well removed from any big city whose practice agitators might try to influence or even disrupt the proceedings. But perhaps most important, it was near the recently renovated Bukowski Palace, with its seventy rooms available for meetings of whatever size might be required. The three names... Buk for the peasant leader of the Troubles, Bukovo for his village, and Bukowski for the family which had once owned the palace, obviously stemmed from the same root, the strong word Buk signifying beech tree. And this was appropriate because from time past remembering, the vast area east of the river had contained a large forest where principal trees had been oaks, pines, ash, maples, and especially beech, those tall, heavy trees with excellent trunks. Through the centuries, foresters had selectively cut these trees, sometimes floating the great trunks all the way to the Baltic for shipment to Hamburg and Antwerp. The palace stood on a slight rise overlooking the castle ruins and the Vistula beyond, and was a place of real magnificence, the equal of the lesser French chateau along the Loire. Shaped like a two-story capital U, the open part with its two protruding wings faced west, while its long major base faced east, overlooking the village and the forest beyond. It had been heavily damaged in the closing days of World War II during the German defeat and the Russian victory, but its many rooms had been rebuilt in the 1950s and now functioned as a museum, a rest home for Communist Party VIPs and a meeting place for major complications. A good chauffeur could drive from Warsaw in something under four hours, and from Krakow in less than three. A major charm of the setting was the village, which perched at the edge of the forest. Even before the rude castle had been built, a few hovels had collected here, and in more than a thousand years which had followed, the number had constantly increased, with the addition of one or two new cottages every fifty years. Improvements came slowly. For the petty nobles, who occupied the more permanent buildings that would evolve into the palace, cared little about what happened to their peasants. Over a space of eight hundred years, no cottage in Bukovo had other than a dirt floor. For nine hundred years, none had a chimney, none had windows, and some cottages had passed a hundred years without acquiring a permanent door. Yet improvements did slowly filter in. A wooden roof to replace a thatch a slab of precious glass for a rude window, so that in time an attractive collection of harmonious, low, modestly colored colleges grouped themselves artistically about the three sides of a trim central rectangle. As with the palace, the open end faced the vistula, with the backs of the cottages abutting against the grove of beech trees. That was Bukovo, primeval forest to the east, a splendid grove of beech trees, a snug village, a handsome palace, ancient castle ruins, and dominating everything, the majesty of the Vistula. Here was where the most advanced theories of the contemporary world would do battle. Sessions would be held in one of the many medium-sized rooms on the upper floor of the palace. The communist representatives reached the palace first, and the custodians showed them to their rooms. 
With so many to choose from, it was easy to get one overlooking the river. Clerks and research assistants received rooms looking toward the beech trees, and some deemed these preferable, for the forest Sheck was in its own way as beautiful as the river. The arrival of the cabinet minister occasioned a good deal of merriment, for his name was Shimon Pokovsky, and everyone joked, It's nice to be in your palace. And he had fun explaining that the Bukovskys would own the showplace were not from his Bukovskys, but nevertheless everyone kept calling it his palace. He was an important member of the Warsaw government, fifty-seven years old, gray hair close-cropped and clipped far up the sides and back, steel-rimmed glasses, heavy-set, with slightly hunched shoulders, squarish, placid face, dark-complexioned, and with deeply recessed eyes. He wore, even in summer, a dark conservative suit made of thick wool and a neatly shaped dark tie. He could have been any communist official in any Iron Curtain country. Actually, he was Poland's Minister of Agriculture, and it was his job to deal with the rural disturbances which threatened the food supply of his country. He was the logical choice for the task, a devout communist who had real appreciation for the difficulties under which farmers labored. He had lived in this village of Bukov until the age of fifteen, watching his father, who supervised a group of farms, and his hard-working mother, who tilled her own garden patch. In those years he himself had often worked on the farms, and his father superintended, thus acquiring a sense of what the problems of agriculture were. After the German occupation ended, he had studied architecture, gaining his reputation in government circles because of two activities. He helped organize strong communist movements among his fellow students, and upon graduation, he launched into massive projects for rebuilding war-ravaged Poland. He was not appreciated by all members of the Polish community, however, because he was so stout a communist that he could find no place in his heart for religion. And whereas many members of the government decried the Catholic Church publicly in order to retain their jobs, then worshipped privately to preserve their Polishness, Shimon Bukowski would have nothing to do with the Church, public or private. He was determined to fight this fellow book, whose efforts to stir up the rural population were causing so much concern throughout the country. Farmers saw Book as the man who would lead them out of the despair in which they were trapped. Government saw him as an incipient force threatening the fundamentals of the system. When shipyard workers in Gdansk formed a union, which they called Solidarity, that could be considered acceptable, if one wished to stretch a point, for it was a movement within the great tradition of European labor movements. But when farmers started talking about unions that would control the growing and distributing of foodstuffs, upon which the nation depended day by day, a new and dangerous dimension was being introduced— one without precedent, and one which could lead to the most deplorable aberrations. This Lech Wałęsa, the factory worker in Gdańsk, was in no way an enemy of the state. He was a logical outgrowth of the state, and although he might need discipline to keep him in line, his dimensions and his capabilities were known. Madjanko Buk, who was creating so much disturbance among the farmers, was unknown. As the leaders of the party warned Shimon Bukowski when he left Warsaw for this confrontation, if Lech Walesa causes us to miss the building of one ship, too bad. We can adjust to that and deliver the ship at some later date. But if Yanko Buk causes us to lose a substantial portion of even one harvest, this nation will be in profound trouble. You get him straightened out. The young man to whom this stricture applied now arrived, accompanied by three farmers from surrounding districts. He was thirty-six years old, stockily built like all men of his family, extremely square of face, with a shock of sandy hair and eyes that smiled easily. He had a slight gap between his two big front teeth, but this was offset by their unusual whiteness, which gave him an appealing expression when he gave a wide smile. Like many farmers, he held his elbows out from his body, as if ready for any assault which might come at him. But he seemed more stubborn than aggressive. He was Yanko Buk, Yanko of the beech trees, 
a name familiar in this village for a thousand years. Some men in his line had been plain yon, a name of solid virtue. Others of a livelier disposition have been called by the affectionate diminutive Yonko, or good old Yon. He was a responsible farmer, supported by a sturdy country wife and a widowed mother who knew as much about rural life as he. How had this wonderfully average man, with less than a high school education, become the spokesman for the farmers of southeastern Poland, and by extension, it seemed, all of Poland? First, he had a strong intelligence capable of seeing that if the industrial unions that comprise solidarity gained the higher wages to which they were entitled, the cost of things the farmers needed, like machinery and fertilizer, would have to rise. And then, if government kept the prices of food down to prevent riots in the cities, the farmer would inevitably find himself in a bind. Increase prices on everything we buy, same prices for everything we sell. That leads to ruin. It was really worse than that. To cover unexpected expenses in the city, the government is actually lowering what they pay us. We can't live that way. Yanka Buk sat opposite Shimon Bukowski and nodded pleasantly. He had never met this high official before, but he'd heard a great deal about him, and he wondered who should speak first. When Bukowski said nothing, Yanko Buk felt no hesitation in plunging right in. I've always been told since you became famous, that is, Mr. Minister, that we're related. That could well be. I came from these parts. My wife thinks that your grandmother and my great-grandmother were the same woman. My grandmother, Yaviga, was hanged in 1939 for resisting the Nazis. Then we are related. With visible pleasure, Book stood, reached across the table, and shook Bukowski's hand, holding it warmly and strongly in his own. That's a good beginning, one of the farmers said and a member of Bukowski's team agreed. Token of a good ending. Bukowski, seeing an opportunity to establish his credentials with the farmer, said, You know, I was raised in this village, used to work on your farms, and during the first part of the Nazi occupation, I hid in your forest. When peace came, I returned to help rebuild this palace, worked on this room we're sitting in, my family was in Krakow at the time, Book said. I'm sorry we missed you. So I know your region well, gentlemen. I know your problems. I don't think you do, a stern voice from the far left of the table said. Everyone turned to stare at the speaker, a farmer in his late fifties, whose worried countenance spoke even more loudly than his words. We're caught in a vice, Mr. Minister. High prices for what we buy? Low prices for what we sell. I understand, and that's why my team has come down to talk with you. It isn't talk we need, Mr. Minister. The older farmer spoke with a harshness which surprised some of the Warsaw men. It was obvious that the old days when rural people nodded and agreed with anything the High Commissioner said were gone. There was now a contentiousness in this room that was almost frightening. Ten years ago, even two. Shimon Bukowski would have come thumping into this room and said, That's how it's going to be. And that's how it would have been. Had there even been a whisper of protest, it would have indicated either by inflection or outright statement, Because that's how Big Brother wants it to be. One always said this with a twist of head or shoulder to the east. In those simple days, what Russia wanted is what Poland got. Now it was all different and both the farmers and the Warsaw men were sparring more with an unknown future than with each other. They were obligated to determine what the relationship between the Polish city and the Polish farm would be. But far more important, they were endeavoring to discover what the logic of relationship between the Polish nation as a whole and the Soviet Union ought ostensibly to be. They were a group of administrators and farmers wrestling with a gnawing problem. In reality... They were forerunners of the 1980s and the 1990s, grappling with one of the most profound problems in the world. How does a communist dictatorship relax its controls? 
especially when the collapse of its economic policies demands that such controls be relaxed. Once the problem was voiced, even inferentially, the embittered farmers knew that they must state their case strongly so as to attain a good bargaining position, and they spoke with a fury the men from Warsaw had never before seen in rural areas. One by one, the farmers voiced their complaints. Poor purchasing and delivery systems caused food to rot in the ground while city stores were empty. Conversely, manufactured goods were not available in the country. The prices farmers received were so low they could not purchase or repair their equipment. These passionate farmers ultimately described an entire economy in disarray. Bukowski's assertion that the government had plans to alleviate the situation was greeted with contempt. These hard-working men believed they were already harvesting the fruits of communist plans. When a break in the acrimonious discussion allowed, Bukowski drew Buk to a window overlooking the forest. There he indicated with the slightest movement of a finger that Buk should look past the cluster of stately beech trees that stood just beyond the village houses. Then Buk stared into the shadows and saw the sight with which the villagers were so familiar. The glint of sunlight flashing back from metal. They're still here, he said. And Bukowski replied with considerable firmness, And there they stay, permanently. Bukovo was one of three dozen strategically scattered locations in Poland, in which powerful concentrations of Russian tanks were kept on steady assignment, threatening none of the nearby villages, menacing none of the cities. They just stayed there, always on the ready, always waiting for that signal from the east which would spring them into action. They are also part of our discussion, Bukowski said, and Book replied, I know. When the session resumed, Bukowski acted as if he expected his reminder to Book to deaden the latter's outcry against the central government, but it did not. Book said in his quiet way, We're not fools, Mr. Minister. We know your government is limited in what it can do. Well, I mean in what it can permit. You're wise to keep that limitation in mind, Pan Book, he said, careful to use the formal mode of address. Pan, or as we would say, Mr. We do. We realize that Poland is one part of a much bigger unit, the great bloc of the socialist republics, and we're mindful of our obligation within that bloc. But we're now talking about the management of a food program for a great nation of nearly 36 million people. The program is in confusion. Even the food we do grow is not reaching the people who need it. At the lunch break, everyone, even old hand Bukowski, was startled by the large number of reporters and television crews delivered to this little village by the press bus. They had come to report on the talks. London, Paris, Berlin, Rome, Tokyo, Washington, and Moscow were represented. And Bukowski, looking toward the forest of Shek, was relieved to see that the Russian tanks had drawn back. Book spoke no foreign language, but Bukowski could handle German and English, so he stepped forward to offer a resume of what had been happening. But this did not satisfy the reporters. We want to hear from this little guy. It's his fight. Book, who had never before been publicly interviewed by even Polish reporters, showed remarkable self-confidence and restraint in giving his answers. He did not assume the posture of one who had told the government what it must do. What solutions do you see to the food shortage, Herr Buck? asked a man from Berlin. Buck replied with great caution. One, to grow any food at all, we face a grave shortage of fertilizer and spare parts. Two, if we want to increase production, we must have more of everything. Three, to distribute even what we do have, we must change present patterns. Bukowski smiled thinly. We're exploring every avenue to relax the present crisis. Even a farmer's union, the man shouted, and the two Poles merely smiled. But in their afternoon session, both sides began cautiously to explore exactly that question. 
and Bukowski tried to stamp out the first tentative proposals. Unions have always been for workers in cities. You can't find a major nation in the world which amounts to anything that allows agricultural unions. Maybe it's time, Book said, and the debate was joined. Bukowski had been warned by his superiors in Warsaw, who had been warned by their superiors in Moscow. You can make almost any reasonable concession you wish. Prices, schedules, priorities, spare parts, lower rates for agricultural gasoline. But under no circumstances should you even discuss a farmer's union. That would imperil the state. A rural union, Bukowski said with attempted finality, would be untidy, difficult to administer, open to all sorts of fraud. It simply is needed. But when all the farmers face the same problems, we're going to have the same action whether we have a union or not. That's the socialist way, Bukowski said eagerly, without a union. A Warsaw official who had not yet spoken now did so. What you would gain with the union, Book, would be the power to control the nation's food supply, and that cannot be tolerated. The fierce confrontation continued all that afternoon. Farmers with their backs to the wall defending themselves against a bureaucracy with its back to several walls. But gradually certain definitions did emerge. The government would not allow a union. The farmers demanded one with powers equal to those obtained by factory workers. Of that there was a stalemate. But certain concessions were agreed to. The government would make a concentrated drive to find spare parts. The farmers promised not to diminish any further their normal schedules of planting and husbandry. And then Yanko Buk dropped his bombshell. When it had been agreed that he and Bukowski would go before the cameras again and stress the agreements, not the differences, Bukowski said, We'll resume our discussions tomorrow. And Buk said, We would like to involve the Bishop of Gorka. Bukowski stopped dead. His head jerked back and he stared at the farmers. He has no concern in this. This is an economic problem. It's the welfare of Poland. Book said stubbornly, and the church is part of Poland. Bukowski went to the telephone to consult with Warsaw. We had everything going smoothly when the clever little bastard threw a hand grenade at us. He wants to involve the Catholic Church. This simple proposal apparently caused as much turmoil in Warsaw as it had in Bukovo, for during five minutes Bukowski did nothing but listen. And then he said, I think your suggestion is very wise. When he left the phone, he reassembled both parties and announced grimly, The talks will be recessed for four weeks. Long after the lumbering press bus had started back to Warsaw, and the private cars of the lesser communists had followed, Shimon Bukowski quietly accompanied Yanko Buk to the latter's cottage where he knew he would meet Book's young wife, Kajimera, and an older woman he had known forty years earlier. In the early winter of 1941, he had come to this cottage, to this woman and her husband, pleading for help. When Book pushed open the door, indicating that Bukowski should enter, he noticed that the commissar was trembling, and then his wife saw them and hurried forward to greet their visitor, and he took her hand. Book's mother, Biaruta, stayed behind, hands folded across her apron, standing very still and erect, for she too was remembering those distant, fateful nights. Then Bukowski saw her, and he left the younger Books to stride across the kitchen he had once known so well, and he saw that clean, hard face with the dreadful welt from left eye to chin, and he held out his hands, grasped hers and drew her toward him in a long embrace. It is many years since you stood in this kitchen at midnight, she said. Then pulling away, she looked at him admiringly. You have done wonderful things with your life, Mr. Minister. The name is Shimon, he said. The name was always Shimon. 
You were just a boy when I first knew you, she said. Think of it, he said to the younger books as he took a chair at the kitchen table. At seventeen I was in that forest, head of a commando, had already killed my first Nazi, the one who had hanged my grandmother. He liked what he saw of young Pawnee, Mrs. Book. Kajimera was of that stalwart breed, which had always kept the farms of Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, and Russia functioning. She was prepared to serve as wife, mother, cook, seamstress, ox when the plow had to be pulled, and always as the sharp verbal critic. It was to her that he now spoke, as if acknowledging that inside the cottage she was mistress. Pane, when I left Warsaw at dawn this morning, the women in my building asked me. I know, she said abruptly. They hoped you could bring home some meat. And vegetables, quickly added. I have Zwate's, you know. Book's mother broke in. Zwate's have no use any more. We can't buy anything with them. But I leave them anyway, to demonstrate my goodwill. Goodwill we know you have. I knew your mother. I knew your grandmother. And women like that do not produce poor sons. They talked for a while of the old days, and tough Bieruta began to weep when she recalled that special night when Bukowski had come to this cottage to talk her and her husband into joining his underground unit, then operating out of the forest of Shek. They were heroic days, she said. These are heroic days, Bieruta. How have you managed to mess up this country so abominably? We're not free in Warsaw, you know. And that was all he would concede. You would let me have some food? Of course. You came here before, begging for food, and we gave it then, didn't we? What can I give you in return? Not Zwates, Simon. Zwates are no longer worth a damn. But we would like some books about farming, for Yanko and our young ones. Books you shall have, he said. Then he left the cottage and whistled for the driver to bring the government car closer so that its trunk could be packed with items of food no longer obtainable in Warsaw. The people in Yanko Buk's cottage were well aware that during the thousand years of its existence, the village of Bukovo had been pulled and tossed by the tides of history. Invasions by the Tatars in the 13th century and the Cossacks in the 17th century decimated the village and the nation. Equally debilitating, however, had been Poland's inability to effectively govern itself. The ruling class, known as magnates, kept themselves powerful by keeping the king, whom they elected, weak and powerless. In addition, the magnates jealously guarded their golden freedom, the right of any magnate for any reason to veto any law with which he disagreed. Poland with its vast, rich farmlands and difficult-to-defend borders, became easy prey to its neighbors, until finally by 1815 what had once been Poland was partitioned and absorbed by Russia, Germany, and Austria. In 1918, at the close to the Great War, Poland reappeared on the maps of Europe. Various parts that had been stolen were reassembled by the Allies, and an old new nation resumed its stumbling, heroic course through history. This brief dawn met an abrupt demise when Hitler's army marched across the border on September 1, 1939, and within ten days occupied the territory that included Bukovo. The Nazis came in with an agenda of occupation and extermination, and on the first list of those to be immediately executed were Shimon Bukowski and his mother, whom the Nazis described as a notorious liberal. Shimon escaped into the forest. His mother was shot. Bukovo fell under the command of SS Major Konrad Krumpf, a low-level functionary of the Gestapo, whose job it would be to govern a set of seventeen villages for the duration of the war. He was a tense man of thirty-three when he drove his own small car into town. He was not tall, not heavy. He had thin, sandy hair, weak eyes that required glasses, and a weak voice that required him to scream when he wished to emphasize points. He was not well educated or as gifted 
in political maneuvering as the stiff Prussians in the SS. But he knew he possessed two traits which many of them lacked. He had an innate sense of where his enemies, Polish or German, might be hiding, and a cunning skill in frustrating them. And he had an almost rodent-like capacity for accumulating facts about everyone with whom he came in contact, assembling huge stacks of cards in five different colors, on which were summarized the bits of information he had collected about them. These files were supervised by two gloomy, nervous clerks. No act was too trivial to escape the attention of Comrade Krumpf and his clerks, and when observed, it was written down. For example, he knew that Shimon Bukowski, the fifteen-year-old son of the liberal agitator Miroslava Bukowski, had been among the seven to be liquidated, and that he had somehow escaped. His card on the young man was voluminous, listing his friends, the books he read, his habits during winter and summer, where he might be encountered, and particularly the names of his relatives, no matter how far removed in the bloodline or geographical distance. It was Crump's job to find the condemned man and execute him, and as he studied the cards pertaining to his target, he saw that Shimon was the presumed grandson of a local gentleman now dead. So Krumpf went to the gentleman's palace to pursue his investigation. There he was greeted by a woman whom he had been instructed to treat with deference, for she was said to be a multi-millionaire from Chicago and from a family potentially friendly to the German cause. Marjorie Bukowska, his cards told him, green in her case, indicating a person of high importance, was sixty-seven years old. Her slender figure and glowing white hair gave her an aura of great dignity as she came forward to greet the commander of her district. She led him into a grand hall, and he was awed by its majesty, and in that first moment he hatched his plot. He, Conrad Krumpf, son of a merchant in Magdeburg, would live in this palace, and from it he would dispense justice to the Poles he supervised. To achieve this, he knew he must deal gingerly with the American woman and her Polish son. Madame Bukowska, he said easily as he settled into one of her comfortable chairs. I must interrogate you on what could be a painful subject. Many things are painful these days, she replied. This missing man, Shimon Bukowski. Shimon? she asked, almost laughing. <laughs> He's not a man. He's a boy. He's a fugitive, Madame Bukowska, he said with such finality that she made no further defensive comment. I must ask you two questions. Please do, she said graciously. Do you know where Shimon Bukowski is hiding? I do not. I would never have known where he was, Herr Krumpf, for I had little to do with him. Major Krumpf, if you please. But was he not your husband's manager? He was, and a very dependable one. And was not his mother, the unfortunate Miroslava Bukowska, who fell into trouble, was she not your husband's cousin? Very remotely. Where is your son? Major Krumpf asked abruptly. Well, you must know that he was summoned to Krakow. He's in Krakow. Yes, yes, Krumpf rearranged his cards and asked. This Shimon we seek, his father Severin Buk, leader Bukowski. He was your husband's son, was he not? That is, he was your stepson. Everyone in these parts knows that. So that Shimon is really your grandson, in a manner of speaking? I've never thought of him as such. In Chicago you were very wealthy, yes? And why are you still in this dreadful country? Because I love it, she said quietly. And you would do anything to assist it? Turning so that she could look squarely at him, she said, Yes, I suppose I would. You see, it's my country now. When the Nazis overran Poland that September, they found themselves empowered to put into cruel operation a plan which Heinrich Himmler and Alfred Rosenberg had worked out in harsh detail. 
Those sections of Poland which lay next to either Germany proper or East Prussia were to be completely denuded of Poles and resettled by Germans. What was to happen to the Poles living there? At first there would be mass expulsions. Later there would be a systematic extermination. As many as twenty million Poles would either be worked to death in labor camps or slain instantly. That part of Poland would never again exist. When deputies like Konrad Krumpf inquired in a general meeting what the ultimate plans were for this miserable, unhappy country, the answer was specific. Every vestige of Polish culture is to be eliminated. Those Poles who seem to have Nordic appearance will be taken to Germany to work in our factories. Children of Nordic appearance will be taken from their parents and raised as German workers. The rest, they will work, they will eat little, and in the end they will die out. There will never again be a Poland. When Conrad Krumpf returned to Bukovo, he instituted his search for the Querns. Bringing in sixteen extra Gestapo enlisted men, he lined them up in the village square, then summoned everyone in the area to stand at attention as he read the decree, which would apply to all people under his control. Every item of every crop raised in this district belongs to the Third Reich and must be delivered to my assistants at locations which will be stipulated. Every grain of wheat must be brought to us, after which we will return enough to live on till the next harvest. This means that no kitchen will be allowed to maintain its own quern for grinding wheat and making flour that might be baked into loaves for private use. It is now ten o'clock. You have till the clock strikes twelve to bring me all the querns you have in your possession, because at one minute after twelve these soldiers will begin searching your cottages, and if they find a hidden quern which has not been turned in, the owner will be shot. From cupboards, from places in the corner behind the stove, women with tears streaming down their faces brought forth the treasured querns. Two round, flat stones, set in a box small enough for a boy to carry each top stone with a hole in its upper surface into which a wooden handle could be placed, which, when turned in a tight circle, caused the upper stone to revolve and grind the wheat until it became flour, sifting safely into the bottom of the box. Some of the stones have been used for almost a century, outlasting three or four of their owners' wooden houses, but all were treasured, and each was surrendered with pain. The order presented a problem for a Yavidka book, seventy-two, and still a determined woman. She delayed bringing forth the little mill on which she had ground her family's grain because she wanted to see what was going to happen to the querns that were surrendered. She was standing off to one side when at half-past ten the first housewives came forward with their precious instruments, and she was horrified by what Conrad Krumpf did with them. Put them there, he commanded and when they were placed on the ground, he directed the soldiers to smash the stones and toss the boxes into a pile that was obviously going to be burned. This wanton destruction of the little machines which had served so well, this violation of the household gods who keep society together, so shocked Yadviga that she cried, Send them to Germany! Don't destroy them! Krumpf did not hold his operations to check who had called out. But from the corner of his eyes he saw that it must have been the book woman, and he could visualize her card. Grandmother of Shimon Bukovsky, we seek. Yadviga left the village square in great perturbation. The quern which she had inherited from her grandmother was one of the best. Two marvelously flat stone, set in a box made of some special hardwood. From the time she was a young child, Grinding wheat in a quern like that was almost a pleasure, and when she grew up and married and had her two children, in addition to her first son, Severin, she taught them to love the process, for it seemed to her an essential act of wifeliness, to accept the husband's grain and convert it to nourishing food. She simply could not condemn her quern to the destruction she had witnessed, and she endeavored to hide it, vainly. Her efforts were quite juvenile, and when the noon search began, the SS men quickly found it. They dragged her into the square, where she was ordered to stand at attention as the stones were crushed at her feet and the hardwood box smashed and thrown onto the pile. She had not the courage to look down at the shattered stones. 
but she did watch as the pile was set ablaze, and she was still staring in disbelief when the rope was thrown about her neck, and she was hanged. Because both his grandmother and his aunt had been executed by the Nazis, Jan Buck, inheritor of the farm, had to be looked down with suspicion by Conrad Krumpf's men. He was twenty years old, broad and solid like his ancestors, and a good farmer. He also owned a forest from which branches could be taken by the Germans for firewood. But his greatest asset was his wife, Beruta, a peasant girl of the old type who milked and ploughed with vigor. When Beruta returned after having watched the hanging, he stared at her inquiringly, saying nothing, and by a meaningful glance at one corner where the cottage wall joined the cement floor, she indicated that something of value lay buried. His eyes riveted on the perilous spot. Jan listened as his wife spoke in whispers. When Krumpf ordered that the querns be brought in, I gave them the old one my mother used. Our good one is hidden. But when we need to use it, we shall. By 1941, Krumpf had executed more than sixty Poles in his seventeen villages. But even so, he was not able to stamp out the beginnings of resistance in the countryside, and the more he studied the instances of sabotage or major thefts of food, the more he was convinced that some mastermind like the missing Shimon Bukowski was in command, and that the acts were by no means isolated or accidental. On three widely different occasions, he had picked up rumors of an underground cell, which operated from hiding places in the forest of Shek, and he wondered if Shimon Bukowski might have anything to do with this. Gnawed by doubt, and irritated that he had not been able to run the missing man down, he returned to the Bukowski palace to talk with its real owner, and not that rather difficult American woman who might once have been its mistress. He had always found Ludwig Bukowski a pleasant man to do business with, smallish, well-groomed, and perfect in his German. Now, as Krumpf sat with Bukowski, he spoke frankly. We have persistent rumors of an organized underground operating in these regions. Have you heard anything? No, and I rather think I would have. Who could be commanding such a body of men? I haven't the vaguest idea. Could it possibly be Shimon Bukowski? <laughs> My goodness, he's only, what, seventeen? I've been thinking about this village, Krumpf said cautiously. And I believe I ought to transfer my headquarters here. Bukowski, who had a shrewd ability to anticipate trouble, said, Isn't it rather far from your other villages? Also the Vistuda cutting you off on the one side. But the more interesting, I mean, the more critical things seem to happen here. During the months of occupation, Bukowski had tried to estimate just how far Krumpf's authority extended, and he'd seen proof that the Gestapo man could order the execution of anyone who provoked him. But he also noticed that, like most middle-class Germans, Krumpf was respectful of authority and had handled the Bukowskis with deference. Ludwig decided he could ignore the man's rather heavy-handed suggestions. He'll probably find it rather dull here. Krumpf smiled, moisture showing at the edges of his eyes. Bukowski could not imagine sharing his palace with such a man, a murderer, a tyrant. So he said nothing. Then, when Krumpf's silence grew frightening, like that of a watching adder, he licked his lips and asked, Have you identified any place in our territory you would deem acceptable? Krumpf rose, took his host by the arm, and walked him purposefully toward the room in which a Holbein portrait hung. I have been thinking that I would like my office here, in this room. I would have to consult with my mother, Ludwig said feebly. She owns the palace. Not at all. In the Third Reich, widows owe nothing, and titles should properly pass to their sons. This is your palace, and I shall expect an answer from you. 
I will consult with my mother, Bukowski said, and he went to his mother's apartment. Kronf did not rise when Ludwig and his mother returned. Before they could speak, he said sharply, To avoid any statement that might be regretted later, let me say this. I have been empowered to requisition any quarters I require. I am aware of that, Madame Bukowska said quietly. And my son and I hope that you will choose to stay with us, if the rooms suit your purposes. They do, he said, rising to give the Nazi salute. Heil Hitler! Laboriously, Conrad Crump continued to file his notes on cards of five colors. Red, purple, green, blue, brown. And the two clerks he had brought with him, or even ordinary soldiers, were allowed to study these cards and could make entries upon them. But he also maintained a sixth file on gold and yellow cards. And these no one ever saw but himself. He was reluctant to title the top card in this pile by one of its honest names, traitors or betrayers. Instead, with Germanic ponderousness, he titled them Men of Prudence Who Can Be Expected to Act in the Interests of Their Nation. It was not a good definition of treason, but it was a justification. On the golden yellow cards he recorded the shame of Poland. Those few who betrayed their friends for money. Those few who sought to pose as Germans, not Poles. Those few who believed that the war was lost and that Poland would continue to exist as it did in these terrible times. Those few who by nature always sided with the victors. Those who preferred Germany to Russia. And those dreadful few who could have been found in any nation who actually supported the doctrines of Adolf Hitler and worked to spread them. From his villages, Krumpf had assembled the names of thirty-seven men of prudence, not yet fully confirmed, and on the night that he established his permanent headquarters in Bukowski Palace, he rifled the golden yellow cards, nodding appreciatively at remembrance of those few who had actually volunteered to aid the Reich. Very strongly did he want to add Ludwig Bukowski's name to his list. But he hesitated before lifting the pen, which would convert Ludwig into an acknowledged traitor. For this privileged list contained only persons who had committed open acts of loyalty to the Third Reich. He could wait to decide about the master of the palace. Kronf's decision to move his headquarters to the Bukowski palace created many new problems for the family of Jan Buk. Now additional troops moved through the village, and surveillance of Polish movement intensified. Renewed drives were made to increase food production, and when a neighbor of the Buk's was caught baking more bread than permitted by her quota, the assumption being that she was sneaking the extra loaves to the partisans in the forest of Shek, the woman was apprehended by Krum's soldiers, dragged to the village square, and hanged. Jan Buk was one of the three men assigned to bury the woman, and that night he was awakened by two sounds which terrified him. From his own kitchen he could hear Biruta moving about, and he knew she must be grinding illegal wheat, an offense for which she too could be hanged, and from the outside he was certain he heard the stealthy approach of steps, which meant that Krumpf's soldiers were spying again. Trembling, he slipped into the kitchen to warn his wife and hide the corn immediately. But before he could alert her, the door opened quietly, and a man slipped noiselessly into the kitchen. Book, are you awake? Don't make a light. It was Shimon Bukowski, creeping in as he sometimes did from his hiding place in the forest. He was in need of food for his men, desperately in need, and had come pleading to his cousin, Jan Book. He was barely eighteen, not powerfully built, but a young man of enormous resolution. He moved like a panther, always alert, always checking his escape routes. He was tired and cold and hungry, and as he sat in the darkness munching bread and cheese, he gradually became aware that Beruta was grinding wheat. Thank God someone is. They're drawing the net very tight. He told the books that in the autumn days of 1939 the men in the forest had been a brave lot, hoping that the Germans would break their teeth in the West and be forced to withdraw from Poland. 
We dreamed, but by 1940 any hope of such victory vanished. Now we have another dream, that Russia will save us from the East. Now it looks as if the Nazis are going to occupy all the Soviet Union. And where does that leave us? Despair momentarily crossed his face. German occupation forever. But you would still fight? Won't you? Without speaking, Jan Buk indicated where his wife was grinding her wheat, and Shimon ceased his eating, rose, went to where she worked, and kissed her. You would be the salvation of Poland. Then Shimon asked Jan the question to which the answer could mean life or death for the books. Will you help us? After a moment, Book said, Every time you strike, Krumpf executes a dozen hostages. My name is on the list now. Four more killings, and I'll be shot. Shimon Bukowski, a mere boy, gave the answer which he and his men had worked out in pain and anguish. All our names are on the list, Jan. Every name in Poland is on the list. It's just a matter of time till those bastards kill us all. So we must go down fighting. We must resist them. We must never let them have an easy night's sleep. So you intend to keep on murdering stray soldiers? We do so much more, Jan. You would be proud of what we do. We can commit sabotage that looks exactly like a normal accident, and they can't do anything to prevent it. Watch. We are going to strangle this country slowly, bit by bit. Jan Buk was asked to join the partisans, not in any big or bold way, but as a minor messenger between units or a distributor of clandestine newspapers. He would not even see a gun until the day of open rebellion. But he was needed. His wife was needed, too, as a supplier of food to the men in the forest. It was an invitation that might lead to the gravest consequences. Death might come at any moment, even for such a casual meeting as this. And to what reasonable end? Victorious Nazi battalions now threatened Stalingrad. Leningrad, despite its heroic resistance, seemed about to surrender. So, with only the bleakest of prospects, Jan and Bieruta Buk cast their lot with the partisans. Rarely had the oppressed of any nation groped so hopelessly for the light that might lead them out of a pit so deep. Shimon said he would arrange at once for Jan to smuggle messages into Krakow and for Beruta to deliver bread. Within three days, Jan was on his way to Krakow, where the underground maintained headquarters. At intervals, young Shimon Bukowski slipped out of the forest to consult with the books, always deep at night, and on one such visit he told Jan, You must take a code name, because our real names must never be spoken. At that moment the storks which inhabited the chimney part of the Buk cottage, as they had done the chimneys of Bukovo for ten centuries, made one of their regular commotions. Jan said, I'll be Bocham, and henceforth he was known as Stork. It was with the greatest excitement that Conrad Krumpf learned that the man he wanted most, Shimon Bukowski, was indeed hiding in the forest of Czech, and that he sometimes made nocturnal visits to his village of Bukovo. Sentries were posted, and one starry night in January he was caught as he left the forest. He was taken directly to the Bukowski palace, where in the darkness Krumpf arraigned him, looked at his horribly beaten face, and told him, You will be executed tomorrow at noon? but not before you are interrogated. The interrogation, a brutal affair, was not conducted in the palace. That would have been unthinkable. But in a former schoolhouse, where the Gestapo beat the young man until he was almost dead, but failed to elicit any significant information. It was obvious he would not be executed at noon, for more questioning was necessary. This was a fortunate delay, because orders came directing that the terrorists be delivered to the Gestapo in Lublin, since they were more skilled in the interrogation of prisoners with secret knowledge. So with some regret, Krumpf dispatched a truck to Lublin, where the Gestapo driver said, I'm looking for under the clock. He was told, Go straight down this street till you hit the square, you look for the clock in the tower, and the door you want will be on the side street to the left. 
On Tuesday afternoon in February 1942, Shimon Bukowski, known terrorist, was delivered to under the clock in Lublin. Jan Buk was in Krakow, working with the regional headquarters of the underground, when he learned of his cousin's arrest and removal to Lublin. They'll kill him, he said. Yes, and that raises a problem for us. Even a man like Bukowski, even he might speak under extreme torture. It would be perilous for you to return to your village. Well, I could work in Warsaw, he paused. I mean, Beruta could take care of herself. We're sure of that. But Warsaw has all the men it needs. What we want you to do is go back to Bukovo. You just said, the village, yes, it's too dangerous for you. But the forest of Shek, we have a promising group there, and we want you to lead it. Jan Buk was twenty-two years old. He had no fanatical hatred of the Nazis, only an unshakable resolve that they must somehow be expelled from his fields and from all of Poland. He realized this winter morning that this resolve would never leave him during his life, and that whether Shimon died in Lublin, or Biruta in Bukovo, or he in the forest, the fight would continue remorselessly, imaginatively, brutally, forever. We want your group to have a name, because we have major plans for your activity. Jan Buk stood silent, thinking of his village and of the public square in which his grandmother had been hanged, and his aunt fusilladed on that first day. And he saw it as a village of peace, one in which many people had found satisfactory lives. And then he saw storks flying home from their winters in Africa, and he thought that they too looked to his village as their home. They too sought repose. He was my codename, Bochan, he said. And thus the famous stork commando which operated out of the forest of Shek was born. To protect his anonymity, the Krakow people forged several papers, which were inserted into the government's records by partisans. An official word was sent back to Konrad Krunth in the Bukowski palace that Jan Buk of his district had been swept up by a Gestapo raid and shipped off to Germany to labor in a munitions factory. We won't hear from that one again! Krumpf said, for life expectancy in such slave centers was not great. In the city of Lublin, at the corner of University and Bastova Street, there stood a rather impressive public building graced by a tower containing a good clock which struck the hours. In the cramped, dark, damp rooms in its cellars, the Lublin Gestapo had constructed a series of windowless cells and interrogation rooms and none in the entire area of occupied Poland was as horrible, for criminals delivered here were not expected to leave this place alive. When Shimon Bukowski was shoved through the small, low door leading to the cellar, he was greeted by a Gestapo functionary who clubbed him over the head. When he revived in the darkness, his head throbbing and his ability to speak impaired, he found that he was in the presence of another prisoner whose voice indicated that the owner was a much older man. Professor Damchik, the voice said. Roman Damchik of this city. Because we thought that perhaps the man was a spy and would try to extract confidences, but there were no questions. And when light finally entered the cell, Shimon was amazed that this man could speak at all, for his face was horribly battered. When Shimon tried to interrogate him, the professor diverted the questions. Two things to remember, young man. Save your physical energy. Protect your psychological strength. How? Never fight back. Let them do what they will. Never get angry. There will be a day of retribution. And a third rule, a very good one. Scream like hell when they beat you. It makes them feel superior. Despite torture and vicious beatings, the interrogators of Under the Clock were unable to get any information from either Bukowski or Tomczyk. They were transferred to Majdanek, a camp east of the city, for further interrogation. Upon arrival, almost all Jews were immediately gassed and Shimon Bukowski found himself with the job of driving a truck bearing bodies to the crematorium. 
However, Majdanek was primarily a labor camp. Poles were there to do back-breaking work, sustained by the meagerest rations. Majdanek consisted of six tremendous fields, surrounded by their own barbed wire fences. Each field contained twenty-two identical barracks, carefully aligned. Shimon and the professor were assigned to Field 4. In Field 4, when a man became too weak to work, he was left in Barracks 19 to die. Professor Tomchik taught Shimon and the others the laws of survival. Avoid the gibbet. Avoid Barracks 19. Say nothing. Do nothing. Like a bear in winter, you must go into moral hibernation. Professor Tomchik taught them that their duty was to survive, to remember, and to rebuild their shattered nation. Field 4 was under the command of SS Captain Otto Gruntz, one of the best men in the business. With extreme severity, he operated his set of 22 barracks in a way which quickly stifled any protest. He was a big man, 35 years old, and the combination of bulging eyes and bristling black eyebrows made him look menacing even when conducting routine inspections. Morning inspections with the men standing at attention, it became a time for Otto Gruntz to walk slowly down the line, shoulders hunched, big body moving forward, eyes peering out from beneath heavy brows, trying to pick out which men might be moved on to Barracks 19. When he made his decision, there was no review, which is why the prisoners in Field 4 tried to use what little strength they still had not to appear sick or weak during these inspections. Among them... Barracks 19 was known as Otto Grunt's Infirmary, cure guaranteed. For all prisoners, food rations were kept at a minimum, so the disease would the more quickly finish them off. Heinrich Himmler himself visited Majdanek, poking his fat little belly and pig-set eyes into many corners, and what he found delighted him. This place is beautiful! Everything works! In his enthusiasm, he announced that the Fuhrer had far-reaching plans for this camp. It's to be a large tenfold. We want a quarter of a million poles behind barbed wire, constantly replenished. We'll build a chain of factories around the perimeter to manufacture many of the goods we'll need in Germany. To guards like Otto Grunst, who were encouraged by this prospect of endless employment of a congenial nature, he explained... Your work in such an enlarged camp would advance our program in two ways. You'd accelerate the death rate of the Polish swine, and by keeping their men away from the women during the years of normal reproduction, you lower the birth rate drastically. Give us twenty-five years, just twenty-five, and we'll be on our way to settling the Polish problem permanently. Finally, Otto Gruntz heard of Professor Tomczyk's teaching to the men. Once he satisfied himself that the old professor was spreading lies and cultivating anti-German attitudes, he knew that he must be stamped out. So on one cold morning after the inspection was finished, he directed his guards to bring Tomczyk to the headquarters of Field 4, the small stone house outside the fences, and there he interrogated him. "'What is your purpose in disseminating lies about the Third Reich?' he began and to his amazement the old man collapsed and cringed like a frightened child. He wept, he pleaded, he threw himself upon the mercy of the commander, and whatever Gruntz proposed, no matter how contrary to what he had been preaching to the men in the barracks, Tomchik agreed. Poland is a fifth-class nation not worth preservation, Tomchik nodded. A superior race must under God's will subdue and rule an inferior, Tomchik agreed. And slowly, as Gruntz continued, laying bare his soul and identifying the drives which motivated him and justified him in slaughtering hundreds and thousands, he began to realize that this man was making a fool of him, leading him on, encouraging him to divulge the horrible sickness in his soul. With a mighty blow, Gruntz knocked Tomchik clear across the room, then pulled him to his feet and began hitting him about the face and head. But Tomchik did not stop smiling and agreeing and nodding. Gruntz looked at the old man. I know what you really think. You think the Russians will drive us back one day. You think the American bombers will destroy Germany. That's what you think, isn't it? No, Tomchik lied. That's what you think. Now the real screaming began. 
real hammering punishment until Tomchik's face was distorted and knocked sideways. When at last he fell unconscious, Grunt shouted for his assistance. I want every Pole and every Jew in Field 4 in formation at the gallows now. The prisoners were confused as to what was happening, for there had never been a hanging except at morning muster. But here came Otto Grunts with three guards who were half carrying the victim, and the voices whispered in hushed affection, It's the old man. For the first half of the walk from gate to gallows, his feet dragged, but he braced himself, tried to control his almost crippled legs, and walked with awkward dignity through their ranks and to the gallows. This man has been spreading lies against the Third Reich, Grunts bellowed. He has proved himself an enemy of the new order. He has forfeited his right to life. It was the cynicism of the sentence which infuriated Bukowski, the infamous insincerity at a time of death. In Germany's eyes, every man in that field had forfeited his right to life by being either a Pole or a Jew, and to specify any further fault was insane. He wanted to scream against the lunacy, but helpless, he stood silent. When Tomchik mounted the gallows, the prisoners could see his face, how it had been abused, jaw knocked to one side and broken, teeth knocked out, and they were sickened. But as the noose was put around his neck, the old man shouted, Rebuild! Rebuild! And he was trying to shout it again when the stool was kicked away. The iron discipline with which Conrad Krumpf governed the movement of food through his seventeen villages made it more and more difficult for Beiruta to sequester any of her wheat kernels or grind them into flour for baking of illegal bread. So the midnight quern ceased operating, and the men in the forest had to forage even more for their existence. One night, against his better judgment, Jan Bug sneaked into Bukovo to plead with his wife for more bread, and she had to inform him that Krumpf had made this impossible. "'What shall we do?' Book asked in desperation, and they considered for some moments the possibility of throwing themselves on the mercy of Ludwig Bukowski at the palace. "'He's a Polish patriot,' Jan reasoned. "'He'll see he has to help us stay alive.' But Biruta pointed out something her husband had apparently forgotten. Conrad Krumpf lives in the palace. And he surprised her by actually laughing. That's where we always do our best work, under their noses. They feel secure in numbers and leave themselves vulnerable. She had to tell him truthfully. We in the village suspect that Ludwig Bukowski is collaborating. If so, he should be killed, Jan said. But we're not sure. You think it would be fatal to approach him? I wouldn't, Jan, because no one can trust him. But the old woman, the American. Beiruta pondered this question a long time, then conceded, All we know of her is good. She helps us with the babies. Then she added quickly, But as I told you, Krumpf lives there. It was almost a challenge to grab food from under Krumpf's nose. Approach the old woman. Plead with her. Jan was so famished that he accepted with no embarrassment or apology his wife's last bit of bread, her final scrap of cheese. Jan realized the peril in which he had placed her through his pressure for her to provide him with bread, and in the passion of that moment of intense love he left her, uncovered the quern, and clutched it to his breast. It is too dangerous to leave here. If you were lost, Biruta, I would... Don't speak of it she said, placing her fingers on his lips. You'd fight on, and that's what you'd do, and we both know it. But the quern that would have ensured her death was taken into the woods, where the partisans could not use it, for they had no grain to grind. Like Professor Tomchik in his final desperate days, Beruta felt a consuming urge to share with the children of Bukova whatever knowledge she had acquired and she realized that she could teach them only if she could set up some kind of illegal school. 
As Conrad Krumpf had explained when the villagers first protested closing the schools, In the future, Poles will not be going to college or even high school. You will grow food and make things for use in Germany. Beiruta herself had an imperfect education, no more than seven years of partial schooling. But she so appreciated the tremendous difference even that little had meant in her life, an understanding so superior to that of her mother, who had started work at five, that she now was determined the children in her village would learn to read and write. So she organized an informal secret school, which met at odd hours in odd places. And when she saw the bright little faces looking up at her, grave faces aware of the forbidden thing they were doing, her heart grew big with pride, and she taught with an efficiency she did not know she possessed. She loved the children and wanted to see them grow in knowledge, and the villagers encouraged her because they knew that even if Krumpf did discover the clandestine school, he would punish her and not the children. It was through this school that Biruta had met Madame Bukowska from the palace. Biruta was with her children one morning, all of them just standing in the village square looking at things their teacher had been telling them about, when Madame Bukowska had walked past, stopped, and inquired as to the children's health. The villagers had always known the madam as an interested, generous woman. They knew that she was not Catholic, but it was always she and not her son who would help the priest in whatever programs he'd arranged for the children. It was she who purchased little books in Warsaw and candies for the feast days. In the weeks following that first meeting, Biruta had occasionally seen the great lady and always treated her with deference not because she felt any subordination to the madam, but rather because it was possible that one day she might need the American's help. Now was such a time, and for three anxious days Beruda awaited her next encounter with the lady of the palace, and one morning she saw her coming into the square. As the great lady of the district passed through the square, Beruda accosted her. Madam, may I speak with you? Of course, what do you hear from your husband in Germany? Well, he was allowed to send only one card. Of course. She spoke Polish with a delightful, almost childish accent. These are trying times. Your name again? Beruta Buk, madam. Our children are starving. They must have food. Well, indeed they must, no matter what happens. Children must not be allowed to go hungry. I was wondering if you... If I could give you some extra food, to Beruta's surprise, she broke into laughter. <laughs> Dear child, don't you know that Conrad Krumpf lives with me? That his men watch like hawks everything I do? Because I'm an American, they suspect me, even though they live in my house. I could not give you even a crust, Beruta. Not even from my purse now, for over there they are watching me. And if you are seen talking with me too long... Those clever men would sooner or later guess about you and your school. School? Beruda repeated in astonishment. Yes, your school, she said, and the slim, erect woman walked away. For six days they did not see each other. But on the seventh, Madame Bukowska passed Beruda in the square, and in the briefest possible exchange told her, I know you want the food for the men in the forest. I cannot help, but Count Lubonsky might, and she was gone in a flutter of gray and creamy lace. For two weeks, Beruta continued to teach her students at night, in the early morning, now in some barn, now boldly in the church, and then she slipped through the forest to Castle Gorka and asked to see the Count, and when Gestapo sentries guarding the castle demanded to know the nature of her errand, she said boldly, he wants to hire a maid, and they forced her right into the castle and shouted for the Count. When he appeared from an upper floor, the Nazis asked, Are you expecting someone looking for work? And upon seeing the young woman, he said instantly, I'm seeking a maid, and they left her with him. What causes you to risk your life, he asked, when they were upstairs and alone. Madame Bukowska sent me. For what reason? Taking a deep breath, she said, The men in the forest are starving. Without altering his expression in the slightest, Count Lubonsky replied, 
I conduct no traffic with partisans. Now get out of here. And he called for the Gestapo to remove the girl. But before they reached the second floor, he told Biruta in calm, even tones, In the bar and away from the river and near the beech trees we keep wheat and sometimes a freshly slaughtered pig. When the Gestapo arrived, he told them, This one won't do. She doesn't know how to bake. If you come upon a young woman who can bake in the German style, let me know. And Biruta was dismissed. After the men of the stork commando had made frequent raids on the remote barn at Castle Gorka and got decent food in their bellies, they developed a daring they had not had before. And one day, just as the titanic battles were developing at Stalingrad, producing the first tremors to attack the Nazi leaders in Poland, Jan Buk devised a sortie which delighted his men by its ingenuity and terrified the Nazis in Krakow by its boldness and its nearness to their headquarters. Nineteen members of the Stork Commando slipped past the defenses of Krakow, but did not go into the city itself. They went a short distance west of the Vistula, where they assembled a large raft. On it they piled an immense amount of dynamite stolen from various Nazi installations over the past year and a half. They covered this with the kind of hay used to feed cattle in winter, then donned heavy clothes and submerged themselves in the river, leaving two farmer types atop the raft to guard the hay. The seventeen swimmers propelled the raft rapidly toward the city of Krakow, and when they reached the big bridge that connected the south side of the river with the north, they hid under the protecting arches, and at night conveyed their dynamite to a plant that generated electricity for much of the city. From a distance so short it would have terrified a professional dynamiter, they detonated a tremendous blast which destroyed much of the plant. Conrad Krumpf knew there was no possibility that the partisans from his district could have committed the crime, but there was good reason to suppose that some of the poles of his village were passing foodstuffs to partisans hiding in the forest. He therefore ordered a renewed search for hidden caches of wheat or private querns, which were converting that wheat into flour and bread. To the captain of the searchers he confided, Someone, it doesn't matter who, has suggested that this woman, Book, might be bringing food to the partisans. She might still have a grinding mill. The captain interpreted this no doubt correctly, as an invitation to bear down on Biruta in hopes of extracting information. So after another thorough search of her cottage, which again disclosed nothing, he ordered her taken to the interrogation quarters at the far end of the village, and there he himself questioned her. He did not torture her. That would become known in the village, to the detriment of order. He simply knocked her down with his fist whenever her answers did not please, and each time she rose from the floor, bleeding from the mouth and unsteady, he questioned her some more, then knocked her down again when her stubbornness persisted. He let her lie on the cold floor for nearly an hour, after which, of her own accord, she rose as if to ask, What now? And after a while he sent her home, warning her to tell no one what had happened at the interrogation. But her face was so bruised and her gait so unsteady that she needed to say nothing. She had defeated his interrogation, yet unknowingly he had gained a significant triumph for he had made her afraid to risk teaching her children. He thus deprived her of the last possible act she could perform to demonstrate her enmity to the German occupation. She went back to her cottage and sat there, no light lit, and stared at the floor. On the late afternoon of November 2, 1943, the Commandant at Majdanek received in code a set of instructions. Subject undesirables. Your camp badly overcrowded. Harvest, home, action. On November 3rd, when the prisoners mustered in darkness, Shimon Bukowski became aware of unusual movements, and before dawn, Otto Grunz came storming down the line, picking out men at apparent random, whereupon the troopers who followed grabbed each man indicated, throwing him forward. Bukowski was so nominated. For what, no one knew. But when he saw the others who had been chosen, he realized that they were all younger men, with modest strength still in their emaciated bodies, and he had to assume they were going to be shot 
because they were taking too long in their dying. When the selections had been made, twenty-nine of them, the men were marched away. It was now dawn, and walking bent against the bitter wind that blew in off the endless flatlands, Bukowski thought how pitiful it was to die for no reason at all. Professor Tomchik had been hanged because he was trying to strengthen the moral resistance of men in Barracks 11. But this group of young men had done nothing specific. They had uttered no battle cries for freedom, nor had they opposed the Third Reich in any detectable way. They were simply being shot. And he remembered his resolve not to die in this supine way, but he could devise no way to escape. He was powerless, unable to make even a protest, and he knew it. I am so weak, I am ashamed. But then from the far end of the camp, from the fields near the main gate, came two other lines, one of men shivering in the thinnest of rags, many of them barefoot and without caps, thin, wasted men. The second consisted of women and children, hundreds of them, or even thousands, frail creatures, some too weak to walk by themselves. Other women helped them. Spryest were the children, especially the young girls of seven and eight, who walked with a certain eagerness, as if glad to be out of their constricted field at last. Almost every adult person in the two lines looked near death from starvation, and it was clear that these prisoners had received even less food than those in fields three through six and Bukowski wondered why this had been. Then he saw with horror that every one in these endless lines wore the yellow star. He was not going to be shot. They were. Up to now, Maidanik had disposed of more than a hundred thousand Jews, but with the possibility that the Russian army might one day soon break through the German lines and overrun the great death camps like Belzik and Treblinka before the task of killing all the Jews in Europe was completed, the high command had decided, in a rush of panic, to get rid of all remaining undesirables now, when it could be done in an orderly way. A thousand Jews marched up the hill that cold morning, then five thousand, then fifteen thousand, more than the population of some places on the map labeled cities. Shimon Bukowski was especially shaken by the awful parade, and as he approached the execution ground, he did not know if he could control his emotions. When he reached the top of the hill, he saw that two squads of machine gunners were in place on the western edge of a deep trench, and he realized that the Jews would be marched along the eastern lip, where they would be gunned down. His job would be to throw the piles of corpses into the trench so that the next batch of undesirables could be harvested. All day the lines moved up the hill. All day, at ten or fifteen minute intervals, groups of Jews took their places along the edge of the pit, and from the tangled bodies below they knew what awaited them. Some prayed. A few sang. Women reached to clutch children who were not their own, and boys and girls in their early teens simply looked bewildered. Hour after hour, the dreadful killing continued until more than 18,000 were slain, and as the lines began to dwindle, a man whispered to Shimon, When the Jews are finished, they shoot us, you know. They always do. Want no witnesses. So as dusk approached, Shimon Bukowski, this honorable man, the son of a woman of superlative decency and the grandson of a woman who had stood for all that was good in Poland, found himself hoping that the fields would disgorge a few more Jews so that he could live a few more minutes. But on this day they did not shoot the burial crew. Someone forgot to give the order. Even when the deep pits with their awful plantings were covered over in the careful way a farmer piles earth over his seedlings so the crops will grow, and when the hill showed only slight mounds running parallel one to the other, the day's work was not finished. Typists in various buildings compiled endless lists of those executed, their numbers, names, birth dates, regional derivations, dates of death, and presumed causes and not a single Jew died unrecorded. 
The methodical masters of Maidonic saw nothing preposterous in recording that on November 3rd, 1943, an exact total of 18,431 people died at almost the same instant of tuberculosis, cardiac arrest, or the flu, and that all of them happened to be Jews. The image of Conrad Krumpf hunched over his cards, ordaining who should live and who should die, was so compelling that Marjorie Tridding Bukowska could think of little else during the remaining days of her life. Early one morning, after Krumpf had departed to supervise the execution of nine hostages in one of his villages down the river, she walked casually along the second-floor hall and looked into the hold room to see if Krumpf's secretary was there, and finding him absent, she entered. Once she satisfied herself that no one was likely to interrupt, she took a deep breath, hurried to Krumpf's desk, and began rummaging for the stack of golden cards. Finally she found it with the neatly lettered top card proclaiming that the persons hidden underneath were people of prudence, willing to act in the long-range interests of their country. Trembling and aware of the suicidal thing she was about to do, she took paper and began writing down the forty-three names. As she was at work, she heard footsteps in the hall, and assuming it to be Krumpf's secretary, who would occupy the room from then on, barring her escape, she supposed that she was doomed, but on the chance that something might happen to save her, she scooped up the cards, grabbed her paper, and darted into the closet, where she waited in darkness, trying to control the palpitations of her heart. It was not the secretary. It was two minor Gestapo functionaries come to make entries in the card system, and they went to the very section from which she had taken the golden cards. They made their entries returned the files, and left the room. When their footsteps retreated down the hall, Marjorie went to the desk, spread her cards, and resumed transcribing them. When she was finished, she replaced the file. She folded the precious piece of paper and held it in her left hand as she walked down the hallway. She walked casually from the palace, gazing with love at those sights which had always enchanted her. There was the chimney at which the storks built their messy home each year. Beyond were the immortal beech trees, those castles of the forest, and straight ahead was the little village in which so much life evolved. She loved that village, and its irregular square, and she loved the people who had occupied it. She walked twice around the perimeter, pausing now and then to inspect shops that contained nothing, and then she spotted her target. Biruta Book. Limping from the punishment she had absorbed during her interrogation, unable to smile because of the wounds across her face, appeared at the far end and saw Madame Bukowska immediately. Sensing that the old woman would not be here without good reason, she walked slowly toward her, and as the distance between the two diminished, each could see in the other exactly what she had hoped to see. Biruta had been beaten close to death, but she still walked proudly, almost defiantly. Madame Bukowska was old and tired, nearly worn out, but she still displayed that inner radiance which comes only from a life actively spent in defense of purposeful ideals. When they stood face to face, Marjorie leaned forward like a village busybody to inspect with her right forefinger Biruta's scarred cheeks. But with her left hand, so that none could see, she delivered the fatal list of names. Kill them all, she whispered. And when Biruta gasped at such a message, Marjorie took her by the shoulders and turned her sideways so that light could fall upon her damaged face, as if she wished to see it more accurately. They are traitors. Kill them all. Abruptly she dismissed the peasant girl as if she, Bukowska, were still gentry from the great house, and Biruta the serf, and then resumed her passage about the square. But as she reached one of the corners she half stumbled sideways, as if struck by a cart no one could see, and she staggered twice, reached out for a handhold that was not there, and died in the sunlight.
Because Poland continued to play such a vital role in the Eastern theater of war, the attention of its patriots had to focus on what was happening along the battle lines in Russia. And every inch of territory regained by Soviet troops was greeted joyously by those partisans who saw in communism the path that Poland must take when peace came. And with growing apprehension by those more conservative men who had begun to hear rumors of how the Russians were behaving in towns they captured. At first, Jan Bug sided with the pro-communists, cheering the Russian victories. But when rumors of a massacre of Polish officers at a place called Katyn Forest began seeping in, he had to wonder. Hundreds, maybe thousands, murdered by the Soviets. But then he heard the pro-Russians describing the way they wanted the new Poland to be, and he was not pleased with the prospect of surrendering his farm to the management of others and he was downright displeased with their proposal to outlaw the Catholic Church. The war raged to its climax, and as tremendous news surged out of Russia, Leningrad breaks its siege, Vitebsk is freed, great victories in Ukraine. The individual battles of the Polish occupation accelerated. Jan Buk and Beruta had to be suspicious of everyone, yet continued their personal warfares against the invader. And inside the charnel house of Madonnik, Shimon Bukowski had to study with the instincts of a ferret every whim that possessed Otto Grunst, lest that capricious dispenser of death and life drag him some morning to the gibbet in Field 4. He was assigned to the concrete rollers, and day after day, with bare hands, he had to grasp those ice-cold iron handles and exert almost superhuman effort with this team to move the massive rollers back and forth so that the roads, in the words of Otto Grunst, could be nice and a credit to the camp. It was soon obvious that a prolonged assignment to the rollers would kill Bukowski. The terrible risk in the weeks ahead, he realized, would be that some morning Grunst might find him in a coma and move him to barracks 19, where, without regaining consciousness... He'd soon starve to death. But then a miracle happened. Each barracks had at its entrance a good, strong cot provided with warm blankets, its own bucket of water, and clean eating dishes. This was always occupied by some newly recruited Gestapo man whose job it was to keep order and forestall incipient subversion. For some time it had been the quarters of a weak-chinned city lad, but when he showed signs of cracking under the strain of watching so many of the prisoners die from starvation, Otto Grunst requisitioned a new man, and he received a most unlikely replacement. Willie Zimmel was a round-faced, tow-headed, good-looking farm boy of nineteen with flashing blue eyes and a congenial grin. He liked people and was so gently simple-minded that he refused to see Maidonic as the charnel house it was. When he first saw the physical condition of Barracks 11, he was appalled at its messiness. Those hundreds of double-decker planks, each with one filthy blanket, those lines of men who had not washed in months, the scores with infestations of lice about which they did nothing, and he took it upon himself to improve matters but only through exhortation, never with any ration of soap or lice powder or better food. Men, you must develop self-pride. You cannot simply live decently with lice crawling everywhere. He always harangued them as if they wanted the lice, as if they had plenty of soap but refused to use it. He assured them every morning at muster, if they would but wash themselves more carefully, look out for the cleanliness of their sleeping places, and spruce themselves up generally, they would feel better. Then, remembering the joy he found in the Hitler Jugend programs of physical exercise, he initiated at morning muster a series of gymnastics. Bukowski realized that Willy Zimmel lived in a world of dreamlike simplicity where torture and starvation and hangings did not exist. He was the perpetual leader of a hearty boys' camp, and he saw the men who lined up before him each morning as skeletons, only because they did not look out for their health. One morning, when a man from Willie's barracks was hanged for no discernible cause, Bukowski heard Zimmel say, But he must have done something terribly wrong. 
The preposterous morning exercises continued until one snowy morning when Otto Gruntz happened to see Willie Zimmel going through a series of wild distortions devised by a Czechoslovakian instructor to train Olympic athletes. While all his ghost-like men but one watched lethargically, not even trying to wave their frail arms, they were a pitiful lot, gaunt, almost skeletal. Gruntz was enraged by what he saw and bellowed, what in hell is going on here? And Zimmer replied, But I want them to look out for their health. And Grunt screamed, Stop it, you pig's asshole! Zimmer was mortified by such a command. He could hear those who knew German starting to laugh. But he also noticed that one man from his barracks had a look of compassion on his face, realizing that he, Zimmer, had merely been trying to help. And that brief look, for that hundredth of a second, would save Bukowski's life. One morning, as Zimmel was walking idly back from the main gate, he happened to see Bukowski straining at the concrete rollers and went over to him. Isn't this heavy work? he asked naively. And when Bukowski nodded, Zimmel remembered hearing of one of Bukowski's first jobs in the camp. He asked, Are you the one who used to be a shoemaker? And Bukowski nodded again. But this time, nothing further happened. A few days later, when Shimon was dragging the road in front of Fields 5 and 6, he witnessed the arrival of some 9,000 women and children, the largest contingent of its kind ever to reach Maidanic. And in that mass of people, he happened to notice a young girl, perhaps 9 or 10, dressed in good shoes, a Russian-style woolen cap, and a new overcoat. He never saw the child's face, but from the proud manner in which she bore herself, it was clear that she hoped to behave well. Transfixed, he watched the child striding along, trying to keep up with the older women, her hands in the pockets of her coat, her head bravely erect as the horrors of the camp unfolded, and then she vanished in the teeming crowd entering Field 5, where he knew her fine clothes would be stripped from her leaving her to sleep in a thin, miserable shift on bare ground, with only a frail blanket to ward off the pneumonia and the fatal bronchitis. For the next week, Shimon could think of nothing but that little girl, and by persistent questioning, he learned that she and her group had come from the splendid walled town of Zamosh. All bulls are removed from that area, exterminated, their places being filled by German immigrants, Zamosh is to be a German town forever, a frontier fortress, no pole to be allowed to set foot inside. This statement was accurate. A vast area around that noble city was to be depopulated, then filled with loyal Germans, and the Polish citizens who had once lived there were being moved to Majdanek to be starved to death. They had done no wrong, but their land was coveted. Now, as he dragged the massive rollers, tall as a man, he tormented himself with visions, imagining this little girl again, whose face he had never seen as she filled his mind. And one day, as he was almost hanging on the frozen handles to stay alive, he imagined that she turned to look at him, and for the first time he saw that she was beautiful, and that she was a grown woman, and that it was she he was destined to marry. And for two semi-delirious days he imagined only his courtship of her and their marriage, and how in the evening she sat with needle and thread, mending her coat. Always attentive, Otto Grunt saw that Bukowski's mind was wandering, and he ordered Willy Zimmel to move him to barracks 19 as soon as he showed the first sign of unconsciousness. But Shimon suddenly rallied, aware that he must prepare for the christening of his wife's first son. And that morning, as he dragged the rollers, he was present when the death truck stopped at the gate to Field 5, and he watched as women in prisoners' garb threw in the bodies of newly dead companions to be taken to the crematorium. And as the wagon filled, Bukowski in his delirium thought he saw the little girl again, as she had been on that first awful day, still in her overcoat, still marching bravely, and when he saw her body tossed into the open wagon, 
he uttered a terrible cry. This cleared his addled brain, and in quivering fury he left the rollers and followed the death truck up the hill to the crematorium. When it halted at the entrance to the ovens, he watched as men came out to strip the corpses of any usable clothing, then tossed the naked bodies into the waiting ovens, five carefully constructed steel-bound ovens from Berlin, each with its gaping mouth. His mind glazed, and when he saw that the next body to be lifted would be that of his little girl, flames seemed to engulf his eyes, and he heard himself screaming, No! No! Again his mind cleared, and he realized with new horror that he was far from his assigned duty, and that if caught, he would be shot at once. So he started running back to Field 5. But this route took him right past the guardhouse from which Otto Gruns conducted his business, and he was terrified, for the closer death came, the more he wanted to live. And now from the guardhouse came the man who would send him to his death, and Shimon was prepared to do battle when he heard a mild voice asking, Where were you? I was looking for you. It was Willy Zimmel, and he told him that the officer who ran the shoe repair shop wanted him back again. He said you were a good shoemaker. Almost too weak to follow, for on this day he would surely have passed into final coma had he returned to the rollers. Shimon accompanied Zimmel to the shop, where he resumed his old job and regained his sanity. But he never forgot Field Five and the little girl in the overcoat, and when his calmer moments returned, he swore that her death would be avenged. Planning how became even more obsessive than his former preoccupation with beer and food. Stupid acts like trying to murder Otto Gruntz he dismissed, but his gyrating mind did evolve six or seven reasonable alternatives, not one of which could he at the moment put into operation. Gradually, however, amid the storms that possessed him, he came upon exactly the right revenge. Having noticed a daring pole he thought might be planning escape, he watched the man intently for a week, then whispered one night, If you make it, tell the underground to wipe out one of the German settlements at Zamosh. The would-be escapee, knowing well that his chances were eighty to one against, and that slow strangulation awaited him if he failed, was the kind of man who could appreciate what Bukowski was saying. The terrible rape of Zamosh must be avenged, but he gave no sign to Shimon that he had heard the whisper. The SS guards were skilled in spotting and frustrating escape attempts. However, over the years, three hundred Poles did escape, and two months after the forced depopulation of Zamosh, the dedicated man to whom Shimon Bukowski had whispered made good his fight by killing an SS guard, donning his uniform, wiping away the blood, and exiting by the main gate. Eight supposed accomplices were shot, but he made his way south, where he joined up with Jan Buk's commando. He announced himself simply, Charlebinsky, school teacher, Lutz, for he had served so long at Madanik that he no longer used his first name, Tetus. The Nazis had transformed him into a man without nerves, a machine existing solely for revenge. Within minutes of meeting Buk, he started the litany that would not cease. We must move east and wipe out one of the new German settlements outside Zamosh. And when Buk hesitated, he added, We must let the entire German occupation know they will never have an easy night in any house they've stolen from us. You mean, Buk asked in amazement, that we just take a village at random, surround it, and kill everybody? Exactly. We must strike dare into their craven hearts. Again, Buk hesitated, but Chalabinsky would not relinquish his plan. The underground leadership sided with Chalabinsky. Buk joined in the assault, but his obvious distaste for the operation was the beginning of an unbreachable rift between the two men. The next challenge awaiting the Stork Commando came when the Nazis began testing their new secret weapon, the V-2 rocket, in the region. On the Eastern Front, an allied victory seemed to roar across the land like a firestorm blown in the Asian steppes. 
gathering momentum with every mile. But on the Western Front, cities like London found themselves in great danger. The V-2s were displaying awesome power, and it was therefore obligatory that the stork commander, which had in its possession plans and parts of an actual V-2, deliver them to the Allied strategists in England. But in this effort they were consistently and brilliantly frustrated by Falk von Escher, who had clamped down on all likely routes of exit. And then one night, when the Poles were sure that he would be engaged in an affair which the storks were staging at the far end of the region, two Poles in rubberized swimsuits dug up the vital parts of the V-2 from the farmer's field where they had been hidden, swam across the Vistula in darkness, and handed a woman cook from Castle Gorka a sheaf of drawings and a wrap bundle of tremendous value. Without speaking one word, she accepted the packages from the dark and frog-like men and took them into the castle where she reported immediately to the Count. Two nights later, when von Eschel was again called to attend matters in his domain, the two frogmen who had been guarding the buried V-2 swam the Vistula once more, this time with a third member. It was Jan Buk, head of the stork commander, who was met in silence by the woman cook and led immediately to Count Dubonsky's study. You are Buk of the next village? Yes. Leader of the stork commando? I do not know them. I hear rumors. Why do you come at such a risk to us both? Tomorrow at half after one I shall appear in your gate, in uniform, in a stolen German staff car, and send you to London. How? Be ready. Half after one. The timing is critical. With that he was gone. He had told Lubonsky just enough to command his attention. Not one word more which might be betrayed if the Count were caught. Valerian Lubonsky received a shock the next morning, however. Falk von Eschel sent word that he would take lunch at the castle, and customarily the German commander liked to eat late, which would make one thirty departure with Buk impossible. At a quarter to twelve, good news reached the castle. Von Eschel had to attend a meeting in Krakow, and he wondered if lunch could be served at twelve-fifteen. In apology for imposing on Lubonsky, and then altering the time arbitrarily, he brought with him a good bottle of Trauminer. The meal was congenial, two diplomats sparring to attain and defend advantages. Their wide-ranging discussion ended when Lubonsky looked at his watch, and this prompted von Eschel to do the same. Look at that, how rapidly time flies with good food, good wine, and good conversation. He ran down the stone stairway to the ground floor, saluted Lubonsky, stood in the doorway, and jumped into his waiting Mercedes. It had scarcely cleared the castle grounds when a second car of the same make and style drove up, chauffeured by Jan Buk in German uniform. A footman opened the car door, and Count Lubonsky with his packages departed. To reach the camouflaged airfield by automobile was difficult. Book was required to stop at numerous roadblocks, but he had the forged papers to pass and the iron nerve to look like a relaxed Polish driver for an important Nazi official. Once beyond the roadblocks, Book drove carefully down country roads, coming at last to a dead end, where waiting partisans took charge, driving the Mercedes away immediately and leading Dubonsky to a hut in which he would wait with Janko Book until the courier plane arrived. The operation, utilized perhaps twice in three months, was known as the bridge, for it connected Polish air units stationed at the Italian city of Bari, on the Adriatic with their homeland. Over the bridge came daring Polish officers bringing instructions to the underground, and out went messengers to various Allied commands. Night fell, and the quarter moon set, and there was no plane from Bari. Midnight came, and Lubonsky began to worry, but Jan Buk assured him that when such a plane was scheduled, it arrived, and at quarter past midnight the sleek black plane did signal. Discreet lights flashed on. The plane circled only once, and landed with surprising speed, breaking in jerks as it sped over the grassy surface. With some effort, the pilot wrestled it to a halt, whereupon dozens of men ran from areas Lubonsky had not noticed, carrying tins of precious gasoline stolen from Nazi depots. Within twenty minutes, Count Lubonsky was strapped into his seat, 
saluting the brave young man who had brought him so far. Goodbye, Book. Good job. As soon as his plane landed in England, men from British intelligence hurried forward to embrace him for his gallantry. Assistants took possession of his packages, rushing them directly to military and scientific laboratories, and he would see his rocket fragments no more. The Count saw to it that the Polish government in exile awarded Buch a medal in honor of his courageous service. The medal was smuggled back to Poland, and Buch hid it carefully, showing it to only one person, Czarubinski. Upon seeing it, the uncompromising schoolteacher from Lodz pronounced it the last gasp of a Poland that is dead. The war ended along the Vistula almost a year earlier than on the Western Front. For by July 20th, 1944, it was obvious to everyone that Soviet troops would enter Lublin in a day or two, and the Polish citizens of that city, who had suffered so cruelly when the Nazis were victorious, would now have an opportunity to observe how these same Nazis were going to conduct themselves in defeat. At Madonic, any late-arriving Jews had already been liquidated during the preceding three weeks, so camp officials decided there was no necessity for a general assassination. But individual field commanders like Otto Grunz were encouraged to clean out everyone they did not like, either by hangings or by point-blank gunfire. Grunz sought out one man he disliked intensely, this Shimon Bukowski, who had escaped Barracks 19 by maneuvering an assignment to the shoe repair shop, but he could not be found. Willie Zimmerl, the physical fitness fanatic, had hidden him. Trials of the lesser Nazi officials were held in Lublin itself, and at lightning speed. A few local Poles, selected because of their unswerving devotion to communism, Tatus Chalabinsky was one, were allowed to help the court in minor capacities, but Poles in general were excluded. It was a Russian victory, and the Kremlin insisted there be Russian justice. Walter Nach, from under the clock, fainted at the sight of his gallows. Otto Grunz was hanged from the gibbet which he had so often commanded at Field 4. When the hangings ended, Shimon Bukowski discovered to his amazement that he wanted to remain in Lublin, for Professor Tomczyk had awakened him to larger responsibilities than those available in a village like Bukovo. Within two weeks of the liberation of Lublin, a university was operating. A course in architecture was offered even though for the moment there could be no drawing tables or drafting materials. And Bukowski, remembering Tomczyk's death shout, Rebuild! Rebuild! and rode. With seven other students as emaciated as himself, he stayed at the home of Professor Tomczyk's widow, and she did her best to feed the young scholars. But there was still very little food in Lublin, and often they ate poorly. On one glorious day, Mrs. Tomczyk found a chicken, and one of the students was able to fetch some bits of pork from the country, and she announced, Tonight we have a victory celebration, and she prepared a real Polish feast, pork and sauerkraut with coriander seeds mixed in, a plate of chicken parts, a fine soup made from the various fats. Now, when the students were seated with Bukowski occupying the chair Professor Tomczyk would have used had he been there, and the soup was served, suddenly Bukowski started to shake, and then lowered his head, and the others were aware that he was sobbing uncontrollably. No one spoke, for in these days of sudden peace people did strange things. After a while the shaking ceased, and with some effort he regained control. Pointing to the rich soup on whose surface floated globules of yellow fat, some as big as a gold Austrian crown, he said, I would have strangled my brother for a bowl of soup like that. One of the most touching moments of victory came at the village of Bukovo, when the men of the stork commander were finally free to leave the forest of Shek. When the men who had endured so much saw the ruined palace and the charred spots where the cottages had stood, they, too, wept. But the most powerful moment came when Jan Buk, heroic leader of his commando, walked the length of the village square, 
no longer wary of spies, no longer afraid of being captured by Nazi patrols. He simply walked past a row of cottages bearing in his arms the once fatal quern, which could now be restored to its proper place. At last he saw Biruta, saw the deep scar across her face, and without calling out, he went up to her, holding her before him the symbol of their hearth. She took it, and then fierce tears coursed down her cheeks, for she better than most could appreciate the significance of its return. The happiness of the books was brief, because a few mornings after surrender, a staff car roared into the village, and a Russian official descended with a list of persons to be arrested. The names had been designated not by Russians, but by radical Poles who wanted to be sure the new state would be headed in their direction. But it was the eighth name which evoked cries of great protest from the villagers. Jan Buk, age twenty-seven, who accepted a medal from London reactionaries. The soldiers dragged her confused husband into the square and lined him up against the wall with the other enemies of the state, where the official harangued them. You are enemies of the Polish people who now own this country, and of the Soviet government which has given you your freedom. You will be taken to camp until your re-education is completed. The prisoners were not allowed to say goodbye to their families or to take with them any personal possessions, and when Biruta realized that she was going to lose her husband again, she tried to stand with him, but the Russian soldiers pushed her away so violently that she stumbled and fell. Jan moved to help her up, but was stopped by bayonets. A military truck now wheeled up, and when it was halted before the wall, three young Soviet soldiers in brown uniforms leaped out, formed a cordon, and loaded the poles into the back of their truck. The prisoners were moved eastward toward Siberia, and were never heard from again. The second session between Buk and Bukowski began with a tour of Bukowski Palace for the reporters and selected television cameramen. During the tour, the guide paused to acknowledge Shimon Bukowski's role in the rebuilding of Poland. After the German occupation, she said, in the years from 1950 through 1970, Pan Bukowski, now a minister of government, was responsible for the rebuilding of Poland's destroyed treasures. He rebuilt Castle Gorka, where some of you are staying. He rebuilt parts of Lublin. But his heart, I do believe, was in the rebuilding of the palace we are now in. Some reporters felt afterward that this tour, instructive though it might be, had been a ploy on the part of the government to inflate Bukowski as their negotiator, but even these doubters had to concede that his work of restoration along the Vistula was triumphant. A French critic wrote, Architect Bukowski made not a single mistake in his buildings. Now we shall see what he can do with his recalcitrant farmers. Jan Buk was no longer an embattled farmer. During the four-week recess, the reluctant Warsaw government had agreed to issue him a passport to appear on Japanese television. After his appearance in Tokyo, other countries issued invitations, and his trip unexpectedly had turned into a whirlwind tour of the capitals of the world, where he met with President Reagan and Pope John Paul. He was now a statesman, so acknowledged by other statesmen. He carried weight where he before had only carried conviction. Shimon Bukowski was not the same man either. Stiffened by his series of hammer-blow consultations with leaders of the Polish government, who themselves had sought secret instructions from Russian envoys who had slipped into the country, he was in no mood to make irrelevant concessions, and in the opening minutes he announced his first decision. We recessed our discussions four weeks ago because Pan Buk asked that a high official of the Catholic Church be brought to our meetings. This request is denied. Our two teams are competent to make all decisions. To the surprise of the delegates, Yanka Buk made no objection, and for good reason. Bukowski had not accompanied the reporters on the tour. He spent that time seeking out Buk and assuring him that together they would meet with the Bishop of Gorka that night, after the session ended. When Buk asked where, Bukowski confided secretly at the castle. 
Buk had steadfastly refused to lodge in the palace with the other delegates, preferring the familiarity of his own cottage. It was not difficult for him to slip away after dusk, but he had to wait for the car that would carry him and Bukovsky to their meeting with the bishop. After a while the latter made his escape, and they sped with dim lights to the town of Gorka, where the bishop was waiting. The bishop of Gorka was a saintly man, sixty-three years old, and with a face that looked as if it had been carved wood and allowed to weather as the central figure in some treasured roadside shrine. He wore his white hair combed forward in the Julius Caesar style, which was appropriate, for his tall, lean figure resembled that of the aging Caesar when the daggers came at him. He was a wise man who had fought enemies all his life, inventing ways to circumvent their ugly intentions and still preserve his own more humane and generous ones. As he told a group of touring Scandinavian reporters the previous year, when you had to survive under the Nazis as a young man, and under the communists as an old one, you learn something, or you perish. The bishop, eager to meet the two men from his district, who were playing such important roles in the present crisis, hurried forward to greet them. You were kind to arrange this meeting, Book said to the bishop. As he will tell you, he said, smiling at Bukowski, it almost broke up the sessions when I suggested it. How are the meetings going? the bishop asked. Bukowski replied, Not at all well. Our differences are quite fundamental. They always are, if the meeting is worth anything. What are they this time? They cut to the heart of Poland's future. The bishop sighed. I am so glad you're talking. I am so very pleased you asked me to join you, even if you were afraid to do so publicly. "'because nations sometimes really do stand at crossroads. "'And I think this autumn of 1981 has been such a time for Poland.' "'We understand the gravity,' Bukowski said quickly. "'And I'm terrified that this man's drive to disrupt the countryside.' "'No,' Book cried. "'It's your rules that are doing the disrupting.' "'Are you two so far apart?' the bishop asked. "'And before they could give their answers, he gave his.' Surely the three of us can find common ground. I mean, we three in particular. And as he spoke, he allowed his left arm to stretch forward rather awkwardly, but far enough so that the men could see that ugly, purplish line of identifying numerals which had been tattooed upon it in the concentration camp. And when he was satisfied that each of his visitors had seen it, he spoke. Shimon Bukowski, in the interrogations at Lublin and Madanik, you went through two of the worst hells this earth can provide. That you survived when so many others didn't is a tribute to your courage and the strong body your parents gave you. But I am equally impressed that on your release you dedicated yourself to the rebuilding of our nation. Here in Gorka I see your reconstructed castle every day and it's a monument to you. Few men are ever given a chance to build their own memorials. You were offered that chance, and you built it exceedingly well. Because of what you saw during the war and the occupation, you became a communist, a very wise one, I'm told. I suppose you understand the theory rather better than you do its application. But because you were so savagely treated at Madonic, you exercise your own authority with gentleness and even love. Poland can be grateful that so many of its communist leaders are like you and not like the Nazi officials who terrorize this land in their day. Mr. Minister, there is no warfare between you and me. I know you, and I love you for the brave man you are. Your governmental decisions? Well, that's another matter. And you, Farmer Book, what a distinguished son of Poland you are. Did you know on that dreadful morning when the Nazis arrived in your village and lined up the people to be executed, your great aunt Miroslava, that's Pan Bukowski's mother, did you know that the man who stood next to her when the machine guns fired was my uncle, Father Barsky of this parish? Yes, 
I dedicated myself to the priesthood that awful day. I told my mother, They've killed Uncle Pavel. I must take his place. So we three are bound together in ways we might not recognize at first. We are three men of this soil, products of the fertility of this fortunate land. We followed three very different paths, but we have all come to the same critical moment in a bare little room on the banks of the Vistula. But we three are competent to discuss the future of a nation we love, and I suppose that's why we're here tonight. The basic issue, Bakovsky said firmly, is that we must remain socialist, and we must remain in tandem with the Soviet Union. But not dictated to by them, Bishop Barsky said. We fought that battle in the church, and we won. Russian communism takes economic production rather more seriously than it takes religion. How oh, don't you believe that? The pressures the Russians, and your own people, Mr. Minister, the pressures you put on the church were tremendous, because communism has always seen the church as competing for the souls of men like Farmer Bukir. Bukowski dropped his arrogance. Do you think the two can coexist? They do coexist, Bishop Barsky said. Happily? How many married couples that coexist in total happiness? Not too many, if I can believe my ears. But the years roll on and they live together, and a sense of decency develops, and children of good quality are produced and brought to manhood, and I suppose that's what love is. Up to this point, Jan Buk had been principally a listener as Bukowski and the bishop parried, but the meeting had been called by him to provide guidance in the areas of his concern. Is it possible to have a farmer's union which would do for us what Lech Walesa has done for his factory people? Bukowski was over-eager to settle that question quickly. Nations do not allow farmers to have unions. No nation does. Up to now the bishop said. Go on, Book. So far, Book said accurately, every gain that solidarity has obtained for its city members has been at our expense. I wonder if that's true. It seems so to us. Seem and is are two vastly different words. Then let's consider what's actually happening. We farmers are being so savagely mistreated paying more for all we need, getting less for all we grow, that we're going on strike. Yes, that's what I said. We are already on strike, producing less and allowing less of what we do produce to filter into regular channels of distribution. We're on strike, and if we continue, the people of Poland will go hungry. Are you proud of that? Bishop Barsky asked. I am mortally ashamed, Book said. Then why do you do it? Because it's the only way we can make men like this one listen to our complaints. Tell me, Bukowski broke in, do you know of any major nation that allows its farmers to combine in unions? Does Russia? No, Russia does not, Bishop Barsky said very quietly. And I suppose that's why that great nation, with all its power and all its marvelous agricultural land, cannot feed itself. For two decades, their farmers have been doing exactly what Book says he's doing. They've been on strike, and not even machine guns can make them stop. How does this happen? Bukowski asked. Because a field is like a human soul, Mr. Minister. It must be nurtured in specific and careful ways. It must be tended with love. The man cultivating it must respect it and want to see every seed mature. He must feel that if he does not do well with his field, his little field, the corner of the earth allowed him, all the rest of the earth will starve. And you cannot dictate that attitude, because if you try, you see what the cultivator of the field will say. To hell with this. Let the field rot. It's an indecent thing to say. And I am broken-hearted to hear a man like Yanko Buk say it. But that's what they say. And if I were a farmer, I think I would say it too. 
I would feed myself and say, to hell with you big idea men in the city. There was a long silence. Bukowski finally asked, Would the church be willing to step in and support the unions, factory union or farmer union? This was about as difficult a question as Bukowski could have thrown at the bishop, for it was asking the latter to lend his imprimatur to what amounted to a new system of government. It seems to me that whenever our church has taken a participatory stand this way or that in the actual governing of Poland, it has performed poorly. I doubt it will intrude now. Governing is up to you politicians, and I would advise my church not to allow itself to be used to fortify your position this week and your adversaries next week. Our job is to provide permanent solace and spiritual leadership to the people as a whole, whatever their government at the moment, so long as it stays within the bounds of moral decency. Have the communists stayed within those bounds? Yanko asked. According to their definitions, yes. Can you, as a good Catholic priest, love the communists? I do. I love you, Shimon. If I had a son... I would want him to be a man much like you, fighting each battle as it roared at him from whatever new horizon. I bow down before you, Shimon, because I know. I know. Again his left arm revealed that horrible collection of purplish numbers, and Bukowski thought, Isn't it the damnedest thing? The Nazis were so orderly in everything but they slapped their numbers on their slaves in such haphazard fashion. I think they'd be ashamed of such disorder. No two numbers lined up with any other two. Then, suddenly in a blazing vision, he saw coming through this barren room the little girl from Zamosh, striding along so proudly in her good overcoat, which would soon be stripped from her, and as she disappeared through the wall... He knew he had nothing more to say this night. At the meeting next morning, Bukowski presented a surprise to his troublemaking farmers. From Warsaw, he brought with him one of the chief communist theoreticians, a man of considerable intellectual and political strength, eager to do some serious head-knocking. He was a tall, cadaverously thin man in his sixties, with deep-set hawk-like eyes, a furrowed face, a dominant chin which he kept thrusting forward when he talked, and a fierce addiction to communism. He was Tatus Chalabinsky, one-time schoolteacher at Luj, a long-time prisoner at Majdanek, and for a short time before the Russian armies arrived in 1944, a partisan fighting in the forest of Shek. He sat beside Minister Bukovsky, as if to reinforce that administrator's flagging resolve. And it was he who spoke first. Fellow workers, when you ask for more fertilizer and better pay for your produce, that's one thing. But when you threaten the state with a strike against its food supply, that's quite another. There is no place in communist theory for a union of farmers. There is no place for a strike against the food supply of the nation. Yanka Buk, aware that the Polish and Russian governments were trying to overwhelm him, knew that he must fight back, and with whatever energy he possessed. If communist theory means that people must go hungry, Pan Chalabinsky, then maybe you'd better restudy your theory. Chalabinsky flushed at this rebuke from a peasant, and was about to lash out, but Bukowski reached forth a hand to restrain him. Buk then said, Pan Chalabinsky, Surely friendship with the Soviet Union, which we all cherish, does not mean that our farmers have to make all the mistakes that their farmers have been making for fifty years. It can't mean that Poles must go hungry the way Russians go hungry. All morning Chalabinsky hammered away at Buk, reiterating that in the grand design outlined by Karl Marx and Lenin, there was no place for a union of farmers, and finally he scored a most telling point. All agencies of production, 
especially the land, belong to the people, who have wisely placed its management in the hands of the Communist Party. It is not your land to abuse, Pan Buk. Wen Bu stoutly advanced the argument that it was the government, and not he, who was abusing the land, Bukowski had to notice with apprehension that Farmer Book seemed to have an almost physical dislike for Chalabinsky, and was taking delight in opposing even the good points the theoretician proposed, and he wondered what could have generated this automatic rejection. He could not know that from infancy Yanko Book had been familiar with the names and deeds of Tejas Chalabinsky, for when his mother, Beruta, was able to talk with those former members of the Stork Commando, who had not been banished to Siberia as enemies of the new communist Poland, she saw clearly that it could only have been Chalabinsky who placed Jan Buk's name on the list of those to be deported. No one else could have done it. No one else knew about the medal from London, and no one else had so consistently opposed Buk's leadership. It was obvious, therefore, that Chalabinsky had murdered, so to speak, the heroic leader of the Storks, Yanko's father. And now he, Yanko, sought to test what this strange man was like. The more he heard Chalabinsky speak, the more clearly the philosopher's character stood out, and the more satisfied Yanko became that this man was the type who could have sent a close companion to exile and death. Watching ever more closely, he saw the portrait of a fanatic, and as he listened to Chalabinsky, he could imagine him uttering the words that had doomed Jan Buk, and his bitterness toward the philosopher and all his preachings deepened. But now the session took a sharp turn, which none of the participants could have anticipated, for Shimon Bukowski took command. Forcefully, and with a good deal of intelligence, he started to hew out the solution to the problems of the farmers. Ignoring Warsaw, and rebuffing Chalabinsky, when the latter grew too doctrinaire, he said, Let us find the Polish solution to these matters. Regaining the chairmanship that was rightfully his, he began a practical analysis of what steps must be taken now to protect the nation's food supply. Always Poland will remain Russia's close ally, respected minister, so I need to offer no more reassurances on that point. And always we will find our solutions within the communist doctrine so we can put those matters to rest. On the one hand, we cannot allow our factory workers to disadvantage our farmers. On the other, we will not allow our farmers to hold the entire nation for ransom. Fine words, Book cried sarcastically. You've made Chalabinsky happy, and you've obviously made yourself happy, but you haven't made me happy. No more of that, Pan Book. We're about to spell out the course of action our government intends to follow with regard to its farmers. Beginning when? Book asked almost insolently. Bukowski ignored him. After lunch we have agreed to hear the complaints of certain women. A farmer who grows grain only for sale to the government, and one who grows produce for sale in Krakow. When we've finished with them, Pan Jolabinsky, and I will deliver our report. It was fortunate that Yanko went home for lunch that day, because he found his mother in a state of distress. She had heard that Tatus Chalabinsky was in the village, the first time ever, and she was trembling to think that within an hour she would be testifying before the man responsible for her husband's disappearance. When I testify, I shall throw the murder in his face, Beruta said, and her son replied, Now that's foolishness, and you know it. As his mother combed her hair preparatory to the afternoon meeting at which she was to explain the plight of farm women during this difficult period, Yanko happened to look at the small trunk in which he kept his clothes, and he saw that a shirt sleeve was hanging from under the lid, something which his wife would never permit. And as he went to the trunk to remedy this, it became clear that his mother had invaded what amounted to his private closet in search of a terrible item. "'Mother!' he shouted as she stood before the little wall mirror. What? Her manner betrayed she knew the answer. Oh, my God! Give it to me! What? She repeated, and remained facing the mirror as her son rushed over, 
frisked her as if he were a policeman, and found hidden in her pleated skirt the revolver he used when on patrol to protect the tractor. Oh, my God, Yanko whispered, falling onto the chair and holding the weapon on his knees. He stayed that way for some minutes, while the two women stood silent. Finally he looked at his wife and asked, Did you know? And Kajimera nodded. We were going to do it to the animal. Yanko remained sitting, trying to visualize what might have happened had his mother killed a high official of the party. The whole structure could have fallen apart. Everything that Shimon Bukowski had been trying to formulate during the last two hours of the morning session would have been lost, and countries like East Germany and Czechoslovakia would have been called upon to join the Soviet Union in stamping out the Polish rebellion. Oh, God, you could have destroyed us all! Very carefully, he returned the revolver to its hiding place for under the disarmament laws insisted upon by authorities, he was not entitled to own such a weapon. And then he went to stand before his two women. You must do it with words, mother. Crucify the bastard with words. Biruta Buk did as her son commanded. Eloquently, she denounced Cherubinsky for informing on her husband, and went on to state irrefutably that the theories Cherubinsky had been forcing on the farmers of Poland had failed in every respect. They have not produced more food. They have not created justice. They have provided no encouragement or hope, she said. Cherubinsky, unmoved and unrepentant, thought only of how some day he might punish this woman for her insolence and for her blatant anti-communism. Shimon Bukowski, during the first stages of Beiruta's tirade, was deeply irritated by her sweeping accusations. But as he listened to her forceful presentation of deadening data, he began to realize that she was speaking for all the women of Poland. And when he closed his eyes so that he could not see her tense and angry face, he could imagine his mother, Miroslava Bukowska of this village, orating in the precise words Pony Buk was using. When he opened his eyes again, he saw a much different Pieruta book, a kind of permanent revolutionary whose ideals transcended communism or anarchism or state socialism. She, like his grandmother and his mother, was the embattled Polish woman, fighting terrible injustices which seemed always in the end to overwhelm them. He studied her face and noted again the scar that marred it and he speculated as to which of her heroic ventures had left her with this mark of honor. And now, as she continued to speak with unrelenting force, he listened more carefully. He did not like what she was saying, but he respected her for saying it. German Bukowski surprised the delegate by announcing a short recess prior to his closing statement for that day, and during the interval the communist leaders took Yanko Buk upstairs. There they laid down the law. It was one of those bare-knuckle sessions which often occurred behind the Iron Curtain, when fundamentals had to be restated, and before it had been underway only a few minutes, Yanko felt faint. Pan Buk, Chairman Bukowski said, the games are over. If you persist, you will be destroyed. Chalabinsky backed him up. You must understand without any confusion that Warsaw supports what Pan Bukowski has so accurately stated. You have put yourself in grave danger, Buk. And Bukowski said, We'll not tolerate any further nonsense. There'll be no farmers' union. You must cease your agitation. You must listen to what your true friends say, and you must obey. The Uncle Buk drew back from the desk and gave his adversaries his country boy smile. Almost better than they, he appreciated the constraints under which they suffered. Russia was afraid to activate her tanks waiting in the woods, because she could not anticipate what Red China might do in Asia if she was tied down in Europe. Chalabinsky could do none of the things he so desperately wanted to do, because the citizens of Poland had turned against his ruling clique, and without Russian power to back him, he commanded little of his own. Buk saw the limitations which inhibited his opponents, but he did not yet know his own mind, and the communists interpreted this confusion as acquiescence. Thus emboldened, 
they continued to hammer at him. Chalabinsky said, Poland's job right now is to affirm its allegiance to the Soviet Union and exterminate any who protest. I said, exterminate Buk. That's much too harsh a word, said Pan Bukowski. But the minister is right. The Polish government will not allow itself to be embarrassed by strikes and agitations. Those who continue to protest will do so at their own risk. They did not bluster or try to deny that they were frightened. But they did demand that he attend to their warnings and obey them. When he carefully avoided making any promises, it was Chalabinsky who made a gesture of conciliation. We have a surprise for you, Book. A most rewarding surprise. But he would not reveal what it was. Instead, he took Book's arm and led him back to the conference room, his manner showing the other participants that they had been having an amiable conversation. Then he startled the reassembled meeting with an announcement. Under our democratic system, which ensures freedom for all, it is impossible to permit a union of food growers. That is forbidden, and the farmer's leader, Yanko Buk, accepts this decision. Everyone looked at Buk, who sat staring at the table. But what our government has agreed to do is initiate a council of farmers who will advise on rural policies and be your voice in Warsaw. This council will have plenary powers and we will listen to it. Book knew what was happening. They're doing this to shut me up, he thought. I'll have a big office and no power. Nothing will change. Smiling, he said, My mother, Pani Book, who spoke here so forcefully, she's a heroine of the Polish resistance to Nazi terrorism. And this afternoon she spoke truth about the mismanagement of our country, and as long as the weaknesses she identified remain uncorrected, I cannot leave my work here. I cannot go to Warsaw to serve as cover for your mistakes. I am a farmer, and I shall stay with my farm. Pan Buk, it is your duty to go to Warsaw as we have recommended. Therefore you can perform a great service for all the peace-loving nations of our bloc. Your job is in Warsaw. Having said this, Chalabinsky leaned back with that bleak smile which indicated that the situation was resolved. When Bukowski closed the session, Chalabinsky rose, walked to where Buk waited, and again took him by the arm, leading him to the front lawn where the television people waited. What's happened to the Farmers' Union? a German reporter asked. Chelabinsky smiled. No nation in the world permits its farmers to unite so as to control the supply of food. Among the social democracies such a union would be especially wrong. The people would not want it, so the government cannot permit it. The issue is dead. And on this gloomy note, the discussions in the Bukowski Palace drew toward a close. Shimon Bukowski, moving secretly and alone, slipped away late that night. Bishop Barsky was already waiting for him. Shimon began to speak almost before he sat down. I am not here to counsel about our meetings. Chalabinsky pretty well took care of that and I'm not here to confess because I'm no longer a believing Catholic. But I do very much want to ask you about something. You seem to be an understanding man. I try to be, but I barely understand myself. So what I provide is not understanding, but sympathy. The bishop cleared his throat. Yes, sympathy I do seem to have. Perhaps it's sympathy I need. Could I speak in some detail? If you leave out the detail, you aren't really speaking. I was present at the notorious series of trials in Lublin when Madonic and Under the Clock were liberated by the Russians. The prisoners in Field 4 elected me to speak for them, and I did. 
These men had been horribly treated, and they demanded justice. So I was a principal testifier. By rotten luck, the first man tried was a fellow named Billy Zimmer, a kind of dumb-witted, open-faced farm boy who had stumbled into the SS thinking it as a club of scouts. He saved my life. Hid me when a terrible brute named Otto Grunz came searching for me on the last day to shoot me. So when Willy Zimmer was in the docket fighting for his life, some men from Field 4 came to me and said, We've got to hang that bastard. And I suppose they had cause. But I didn't, for Willy had saved my life, and he saved it twice because he also rescued me from the concrete rollers, which would have killed me in a couple more days. I refused to say anything bad about him. But I wasn't saying much good either, because I wanted these trials to produce results. I wanted men like Gruntz to hang, but I wanted Willie Zimmer to live. And then I thought of exactly the right thing to say. I told the judges that the Nazi command didn't trust Willie because he was too lenient with the prisoners in his charge. And I related how Otto Gruntz had come along one morning and called him a pig's asshole. The judges laughed. The other witnesses laughed. In the docket, Willie Zimmer laughed, a big, dumb farm boy from some German village. And in the end, he was acquitted. I had saved his life. That the men from my field would wanted him hang came to me and raised hell. You dumb fool, they said accusingly. Your joke let him get away. And they warned me that if I did anything like that with Otto Gruntz, enabling him to escape, they would hang me in his place. The warning was unnecessary. No man in Field 4 was more eager than me to see Otto Gruntz hang. I wanted to strangle him with my own hands. I testified to everything that I'd seen Gruntz do. The hangings for no cause, the dragging of sick prisoners to Barracks 19, where they were left to starve to death, everything. And then, because it seemed so long ago and so ordinary, all the killings, I invented three reedy horrible stories, and I saw the judge shudder. But most of all, here Bukowski stopped. He reminded the bishop that he must remember that at the time of the Lublin trials he had weighed barely a hundred pounds, and he said with a bitter smile he was not in very good shape. He asked if he could have some brandy, and Bishop Barsky left the room and rummaged for some. He'd studied Bukowski. The judges looked at me, but so did Otto Gruntz. And he smiled. The worse my lies became, the wider his smile grew, as if he were saying, See, you're no different from me. He knew what I was doing and why I was doing it, but he also knew in time of passion the Polish hero was no different from the Nazi torturer. My accusations were so appalling that the judges asked if I would swear to them, and I cried, I swear on the Bible itself. So Otto Gruntz was hanged from the very gibbet on which he himself hanged so many. And I waited there in the front line, staring at him. And as he stood on the white stool with the rope about his neck, he smiled down at me, still accusing me of being his brother, of being his Polish counterpart. He smiled at me at night. I cannot drive him from my conscience. He tried to murder me, and I murdered him. Is there anything I can do to get this hateful man out of my soul? Bishop Barsky sipped his brandy, studied the glass, and said hesitantly, A man runs a grave risk, Shimon, when he presumes to administer punishment, because God may have plans which are quite different.
Bokovsky was shocked. Do you mean those monsters should have gone free? No, no, it was proper that they should hang, because the foulness of their lives condemned them, not you or I. I would still be willing to condemn them for the terrible things they did. But doesn't it seem strange, Shimon, that the large criminals at Germadonic and my Auschwitz were hanged with great fanfare, while the little criminals who terrorized our villages along the Vistula, they all escaped. Mukovsky's tense jaw muscles showed that he was reliving painful defeats, and when he could not speak, the bishop did. Conrad Krumpf, who ordered your grandmother hanged, he fled to Paris, sold some of the art treasures from your palace, bought his way to Paraguay, where he runs a big estate. The two men studied their brandy in silence, which was broken in a curious way. Bishop Barsky clapped his hands and broke into a hearty laugh. Shoving his glass aside, he reached across the table and patted Shimon on the hand. It's really quite funny, Bukowski, that you should consult me about a Nazi monster whom you can't get out of your soul, because I have a little Jewish rabbi that I can't get out of mine. He laughed again and poured Bukowski another drink. You may not know it, but in Auschwitz, the Nazis were particularly brutal with priests and rabbis, because they felt a need to ridicule and denigrate all religions except their own. This meant that priests and rabbis were often thrown together, and there was one horrible little cell with only one small window rather high up, into which they crammed sixty or more men at dusk, expecting to find thirty-eight or thirty-nine of them suffocated by morning. Twice I spent a night in that cell. I survived the first time, one of nineteen who did, because as I was about to be jammed inside, a little Jewish rabbi whose name I never knew whispered just four words, Stand opposite the window. That was all. When I found myself inside, one of that scrambling mass, I saw what he meant. For all the big and powerful fellows were fighting for a place near the window, which allowed me freedom to take my place against the wall on the opposite side. Secure in position and tall enough to have my head slightly above the others, I learned two things. Such air that did come into the room drifted my way, and those struggling to intercept it at the window killed one another. Toward morning, when I looked as if I might be one of the survivors, I began to look for my benefactor. But he wasn't in the cell. Of that I was sure, for he certainly wasn't one of those still standing, nor was he among the corpses piled on the floor. When I got out, I found that he, along with several others, had been at the end of the line and could not be pushed in. They would be held over for the next night. I saw the little Jew on the work detail next day, lifting great rocks when we'd had no food, not even breakfast soup, and I'd had no sleep. When he saw that I'd survived, his eyes glowed, and he started to come over to speak to me, but guards saw him move, and they kicked him to death. Before my eyes, they kicked him to death. And as he lay there in the prison yard looking up at me, his face torn apart and covered with blood, I wanted with all the force in my body to rush over and comfort him, to take him in my arms, for he had saved my life, and he deserved that consolation in the moments when he was leaving his. But I could not. I had no physical or moral power. The cell had been too terrible, and I stood motionless as they kicked my Savior to death. What was the last thing he did on this earth? He smiled at me. Through the blood that dimmed his eyes, he smiled at me as if to say, Be not afraid. I seemed to hear this little Jewish rabbi using the words of Jesus Christ. Bishop Barsky lowered his head to the table. 
and whether he was weeping or praying, Bukowski could not determine. When he had composed himself, he blew his nose and said, I am with this nameless little man three or four nights a week, when I try to sleep. And if I am indeed sympathetic to the trials of others, as some say I am, it's because of the counsel I take with him. He saved my life, and I was powerless to save his. Suddenly he reached forward to take Bukowski's hands again. We can never exercise the spirits that really matter in our lives, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you're Otto Gruntz. Maybe he is the crucial member of your life, the way the Jewish rabbi is the vital member of mine. But the bearing of false witness, my lies about a doomed man that continues to worry me. Lies! Who escapes them, Shimon? Men like Gruntz destroy themselves. You merely nodded approval. Don't let him haunt you. I shall try, Bukowski assured the bishop. But my other haunting is much more deadening in a way. It comes from a much different source. Such as? Well, I'm much like you. I never married, you know. I didn't know. I saw you looking at me in surprise at the conclusion of our meeting the other night. Yes, it was clear that some powerful crisis had come over the talks. You looked quite shaken. I was. Whenever the soul of Poland, her continued existence, that is, comes under discussion, a little girl in an overcoat enters the room and walks past me without looking and vanishes through the opposite wall. Tell me about her. One morning, when I felt I was at the end of my rope, I witnessed the delivery of a batch of women and children from the dispossessions at Zamosh. In that mass, some ten thousand, I think, I saw this little girl, nine or ten, perhaps, wearing a new overcoat, and a Russian-style woolen cap. She was very brave. For some moments he could not speak. I never saw her again, father. Not really, that is. But I kept thinking about her, and I convinced myself that I did, and always she had on that overcoat. And then I imagined that she was a grown woman, and I married her. And in my madness I used to see us sitting together by the fire in an ordinary cottage. Me tired from work in the field. She mending her overcoat. I do believe my obsession saved me from dying. I risked my life one day by quitting my work and following the death truck that carried her to the crematorium. But whether it was really she or not, I cannot say. For I was so near death that I was not myself. But I was sure that I saw them lift her out as I used to lift out the bodies of children. And I waited until they threw her into the furnace. He stared at the table. A man with a burden too heavy to bear. I never married, you know. I didn't know, the bishop repeated. And then the two men sat in silence. The two men may have triumphed over the fire and ice, but they carried scars external and internal that would never heal. And each man knew it, regarding both himself and the one who sat opposite. How did you gain the courage to survive Auschwitz? Shimon asked. And the bishop realized that what the younger man had wanted to ask was, How did we gain the courage? And he answered, Character is the sum of all we do before the age of twenty. 
You did certain things in those formative years which made you brave and durable. What did I do? When I was a student at Krakow, I used to go out into that glorious square at night, and at six minutes to the hour stand silent, and stare at the dark tower from which the trumpeters sounded the signal which saved the city from the Tatars. I speculated on how I might have behaved in his place. I vowed then that if my testing ever came, I would sound my warning. Without that boyhood commitment, how could I have survived the camp? And Poland is bound by these same rules. The bold things it did when young have determined how it shall act when mature. I think we govern ourselves with more justice than either Germany or Russia. And if you look at their Nazism and communism, we certainly turned out better. The two patriots contemplated this truth in silence, after which the bishop cleared his throat and said, God and brave men have saved our nation in the past. What do you and our friend Jan Bug propose to help us escape this time? His voice dropped a full register. We're in terrible danger, Shimon. You know that. Chalabinsky has made the big decision. No farmer's union. I'm making a decision almost as big. Every concession possible to get back to the production of food. And from you, Bishop, we want one of the biggest concessions of all. We want you to appear tomorrow on the steps of the palace. When we announce the agreement, all of us beg you. Even Chalabinsky. Especially Chalabinsky. He says no government can rule unless there is a perception of legitimacy. And he says that in Poland, legitimacy is conferred by the Catholic Church and by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, although he said the names in somewhat different order. Bishop Barsky rose and went to the map of Poland, which served as the sole decoration in the bare room. Do you think, Shimon... But this map of Poland is fixed. Has our map ever been fixed? If the two Germanies are allowed to unite, can't you see that they'll march again to recover their lost lands? If the Soviet Union becomes more irritated with us, don't you see that they'll send their tanks rumbling in, and once more our lands will be ripped away from us? The two patriots studied the fragile map and they could visualize the sweep of armies across it. They could hear once again the sound of hobnailed boots. We must all of us be so careful of what we do, not to alert the sleeping tanks. They're everywhere, in carefully concealed positions, Shimon said. Today the patriotic men of Poland, like Janko Buk, are struggling for a better society, and once more there are nations who fear her, want to destroy her. I'm sorry to see you allied with the tanks in the forest. The bishop, recognizing Shimon as wise and patriotic, did not wish to end his conversation on such a somber note. So as he walked Bukowski to the door, he said, Shimon, clear your mind of torments. Put the ghosts to sleep. That is not so easy. Think of it this way. The little girl from Zamosh died to save you. The little Jew from the synagogue died to save me. But Jesus Christ died to save us all. When Bukowski neared the village on his way back, he stopped his car so that he might look at the ruins of the old castle, and he stayed there for more than an hour, just sitting in the dark, allowing images to flash through his mind. Bishop Barsky and the little rabbi, the girl in her overcoat, the grinning Otto Grunz, and the bowl of hot, fatty soup at Pawnee Tomjik's. 
After some time of contemplation of the past, he walked the beautiful lanes of the village and crept to the cottage of Yanko Buk, where he tapped softly on the window. After a moment, he awakened someone inside, and cautiously the door was opened. It was Yanko's wife, Kajimera, the country girl, and she was perplexed, for it was still two hours before dawn. What is it? she whispered, for the others were still sleeping. I came here before like this, he said. Let me in. I'll fetch Yanko, she said. He grasped her arm. It is not Yanko that I seek. He brushed past her and went into the house, where he awakened Yanko and his mother. When they stood before him, he said, Years ago I came into this room at this time of night to beg you with tears in my eyes, Biruta, for food to keep me alive. We gave you what we had, she said, drawing her nightdress about her. Tonight, he was trembling violently, and in the dim light sweat showed across his face. Tonight, I have come on a much different mission. I have been alone. I am still a prisoner in Madanik. I can no longer fight them all. They stood in the near darkness, exactly as they had done on that night when Biruta had worked the stones of her quern, making the forbidden bread for which other women in this village had given their lives. And Biruta and Shimon were as frightened now of the dangers which assailed their country as they had been then. But finally, he found the courage to say, I can no longer bear the burden of these days alone. Biruta, will you marry me? Next day, December 5th, 1981, at one in the afternoon, when the discussions ended and Shimon Bukowski stood before the television cameras to explain what had been achieved, he finished his terse announcements with generous praise for your good neighbor and good farmer, Yanko Buk. Buk took the microphone, and with a bow to Chalabinsky said, Our little village has been honored to have such a distinguished visitor. Our talks have been amiable, which was good, because they dealt with vital subjects. I am pleased with what has happened here. It bodes well for our nation. I close with two personal announcements. I have been asked, as you heard yesterday, to leave you and go to Warsaw to serve in the government. I shall not go. He turned to face Chalabinsky, who gasped. I am a farmer, fighting for farmers' rights, and the battlefield is here. My second announcement is one which gives my heart joy. My mother, Biruta, who fought the Nazis for so many years and who bears the scars to prove it, has agreed to marry Shimon Bukowski, who fought them in his own way and bears his own scars. In these meetings I have found him to be a resolute man of honor, and I am proud to have him join my family. On the wedding day... Pope John Paul sent a telegram conveying his blessing. But Tatus Chalabinsky, brooding in his Warsaw headquarters, did not. He was outraged that a member of his team should be marrying this Biruta book woman who had so scathingly attacked him during the palace meetings. Now from his desk he took out a pile of index cards, gold and yellow, on which he had for some time been listing names of those Poles who would have to be arrested when the inescapable crackdown came. The people named on those cards that were marked with a black cross would be sent to the concentration camps, which would eventually be needed. And to this growing list, he added Shimon Bukowski and his wife, Biruta. But for the time being, the Russian tanks remained well hidden. 
deep within the forest of Shek.